Um, there may be one or two, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Maybe as you sort of wake up this morning, uh, your your memory is a bit better than mine and you can put me right. Meanwhile, of course, a former president, Jacob Zuma's party, MK, they've gone to the electoral court to uh, basically try and overturn the decision of the electoral commission to uphold, I think I've got this right, to uphold the objection to his name being on the list of candidates for MK. And you know the argument here. The Electoral Commission received object, an objection or objections to his name being included as a candidate. As I understand the law and the IEC's interpretation of it, the law says that you cannot go into Parliament or the provincial legislature or be a councillor if you have been sentenced to a term of more than one year with, in jail with in the last five years, and uh, he was uh, sentenced to a term of more than one year in jail. Anyway, there are various claims here. Some people say he got a presidential pardon, therefore it doesn't matter. But I don't think that's what happened. My memory was that he was, was uh, he received a medical parole, and that's still uh, being appealed in the courts. The University of Fort Hare yesterday, 15 people arrested over the long weekend for their involvement, their alleged involvement in uh, corruption at Fort Hare. Um, all of this coming out in documents yesterday. They appeared in court yesterday. 170 million rand flowed through one of the chief directors, Isaac Pleike, yesterday. Um, and one of the people arrested is the office manager for the vice chancellor, Professor Sakela Bukhlungu. Can you imagine? You know, you're working to try against the corruption as he is, and your office manager is one of the people arrested. Just incredible. I thought that was really quite something. A standard bank. This is on the front page of Business Day uh, this morning. And they've looked at the income received, the money paid to the top management at Standard Bank. They paid the top management together, paid 400 million rand. Sim Chabalala, the CEO, if you're listening, Sim, good morning. Um, he received 83 million rand in compensation last year. Most of it, I must just say, is incentives. You know, they have share structures and things that mere mortals like I cannot understand. He wasn't the only one who did all right. The chief financial officer, Honor Dunke, received 68 million rand. The chief operating officer, uh, Margaret Nienaber, uh, 59 million rand. Mdu, did you and I go into the wrong career? Uh, it, there's, a, there's a very sharp nodding of the head from him do I think Stanza's making comments about bankers and numbers and how I could never be one of those Stanza thank you yes um, but yeah uh, really uh, it's astonishing isn't it that's on the front page of Business Day this morning and then he heard Loyanda's story I find this exceptional actually really interesting that the de- the process to find a deputy public protector had to be stopped because uh, the former public protector Busasim Kobane uh, she represents the EFF She's, she, she was put on the panel by her party and it turns out that one of the law, one of the people, one of the candidates is representing her as a lawyer. And one of the other candidates was someone who was fired by Mkobani when she was the public protector. And there's so obviously a conflict there. I don't think we even need to argue about it. Mkobani says that she's been treated unfairly. You know the number? 86 203 SMS 41391. You tweet SFM Radio and at Stephen Crutus. Send your WhatsApp voice notes to 0614-104-107. Nice to have you along. Good morning. It could have passed six. The Daily News Diary on SAFM. Leander Mayome, good morning. Stephen, are you good? I'm well. How are uh, you? Ah, man, listen, you know when you read out those numbers? Yeah. Mate, I had so many regrets on my life choices. Yeah, when well, you're receiving, <laughs> you know, messages from your parents already Ooh, saying, well, we told you to do the BCOM. Goodness me, listen. Yeah. Yo, 80, 80 what? 83 million rand. Yeah. In yeah. one year. Yeah. Yeah, no, you yeah. know what? Yeah. But anyway, I guess he's ended because, you know, he's went to school and did all the right things, got appointed to the right yeah. place. And made money for the institution. And be the made argument. the money and it's part of yeah. the incentives. So, yeah, it is what it is. The <laughs> only good thing. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Edward absolutely. Kiesvetter, are you listening? Is that probably 40 million of it went, yeah, went to Edward Kiesvetter? A bulk of that. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Stephen, uh, now that the North Houting High Court in Pretoria has ruled to strike off the role and application by the National Assembly Speaker Nosiv Yomapisa Ngakula. Now the question is, what happens next? Will we? Will this we is keep, so we, interesting as yeah. to what happens next because mm. I mean, as I say, the pressure must be on the NBA to make an arrest. Absolutely, uh, there's no other way. For me, it's either she, you know, she hands herself over, or you know, they tell her that there's yeah. no case. Either way, something must happen because yeah. after all that song and dance in court, something has to happen. So let's find out exactly. And the what NBA happens. was forced to reveal its case against her by 
by her. So now mm. we all know that it's four million rand. Absolutely, absolutely. So Stephen, we're definitely keeping an eye on that one. And another one we're keeping an eye on, Stephen, is the Umkondo Wesizu party member Visvin Reddy appearing before the Chatswet Magistrates Court today on charges of inciting violence. I think others would remember that video that where Reddy uh, said they, there will be violence and unrest if the MK party was excluded mm. from the May 29 general elections. Quite a fiery speech, by the way, by him. It was, and I think somewhere in the middle of it, he might have apologized afterwards. Mm-hmm. I'd need to go and check mm-hmm. that. Um, he appears, I think it's the Chatsworth Magistrates Court. Yes. Lorinda, can you remember anyone being charged with something like this during an election before? Because I couldn't off the top of my no, head. No, no, no. I, I, I can't at, the, at mm. the top of my head, no. I, I think our elections have been quite, yeah, have been yeah. quite <laughs> civilized yes. up until now. Yes. I think with the, with the stakes being so high, we expect mm. more and more of these mm. incidents mm. to come across. So, yeah. yeah. Let's look at let's find out what happens there. Now, Stephen, a very sad story here. <clears throat> it's eleven months now since that story of babies being placed on cardboard boxes surfaced out of, uh, from the northwest. The Northwest Department of Health then launched investigations on why the babies were placed in boxes instead of cribs at the Mahikeng Provincial Hospitals. Uh, now the outcome of that investigation has still not been finalized, sure. either not finalized or not been made mm. public, but we still don't know what happened there. Yeah. So we'll definitely be following up on that one, still, Stephen. And also we're going back to Haman Skral to assess the progress on water pro- pro- provision following promises made by the Water and Sanitation Minister Senzo Mkunu and Mayor Celia Brink uh, um, following the death there of the scores of people because of cholera in May last year. Of course, they announced uh, that uh, residents can expect drinkable water from their taps at least by March this year. Well... Much yeah. has come and gone. Yeah. Let's find out. You know, indeed, strange, Stephen. It's crazy. And finally, Stephen will also be keeping an eye on the media briefing by the ANC Youth League, addressing what they term various issues at the party's literally house headquarters today. So let's find out what they have to say. So uh, the former president is on suspension. You think might come up? <laughs> could well be. Could well be. <laughs> Leander Mayome, thank, thank you. you. We'll be listening on the radio nineteen minutes after six. First in the morning, SAFM Sunrise with Stephen Grutis. Let's have a look at your weather around the country this morning. Tswane, partly cloudy, isolated showers and thunder showers from the afternoon, 15 and 28. Johannesburg, partly cloudy, scattered showers, thunder showers later, 12 and 26. Vroenigheim, partly cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers from the afternoon, 14 and 27. Pombela, morning fog patches, otherwise partly cloudy, isolated showers, thunder showers later, 17 and 23. Polokwane, partly cloudy, 14 and 25. Mahekeng, partly cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers, 15 and 28. Freiburg, partly cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers, 15 and 26. Mangung, partly cloudy, scattered showers, thunder showers, 13 and 26. Kimberley, partly cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers, 16 and 26. Uppington, partly cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers, 16 and 26. Cape Town, partly cloudy in the morning, otherwise fine and moderate to fresh southeasterly wind, 15 and 24. George, partly cloudy, a light southeasterly wind, 13 and 22. Gobecha, partly cloudy, a moderate westerly wind, 15 and 24. East London, partly cloudy, a light westerly wind, 14 and 24. Etiquini, cloudy, isolated showers and rain, a moderate to fresh southwesterly wind, 22 and 27. Richards Bay, cloudy, isolated showers and rain, a moderate to fresh southwesterly, 21 and 27. And Peter Maritzburg, morning fog patches, otherwise cloudy, isolated showers, thunder showers from the afternoon, 18 and 25. The Industrial Development Corporation, IDC, believes in the power of transformation and driving sustainable economic growth. We're not just financiers. We're architects of opportunity and partners in shaping our communities for a shared, brighter tomorrow. Our mandate for inclusivity in the economy is the reason we fund black industrialists, black-owned companies, women, and youth-empowered enterprises. Speak to us for tailored funding support and let us catalyze industries and create jobs together. The IDC. Our dream is for the legends who make moves to save and pay from as little as 45 rand from Pretoria to Midrand. It's for our clever who turn five liter bottles into workout dumbbells. And for the slim oaks who bring a home cooked scuff team to work every day. So when it comes to travel, make moves that save and pay from as little as 45 rand from Pretoria to Midrand Station. How train for people on the move. Aston Villa have found comfort on the top half and they want maximum points to retain their decent position. And this time, Daniolo is on! The equaliser belongs to Aston Villa! Yet the Bees want 
to cause havoc and deprive the villains by registering an away victory. Wissar tried one of them in the first half. He's finished it in the second and Brentford have turned this round. This is the Premier League. Catch the exciting clash between Aston Villa FC and Brentford FC on Saturday 6 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you on SABC Sport. Worldview Update, bringing you closer to international news. 22 minutes after 6, good morning. In Russia, Ukraine has now claimed it was responsible for a drone attack that killed 12, that hurt 12 people over 1,300 kilometers inside Russian territory. At the same time, the Ukrainian president, President Volodymyr Zelensky, has now signed into law a measure that reduces the age of conscription from 27 to 25. In other words, more young men will now be available to be conscripted scripted into the Ukrainian army. It seems, though, that Russia is able to increase the number of soldiers it has amid suggestions Russia is preparing for a major offensive in Ukraine. The weather there, of course, is changing as it gets warmer as the Northern Hemisphere winter ends. Professor Abel Erstehes is a professor of strategy at the Faculty of Military Science at the University of Stellenbosch. Professor, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. We've seen Ukraine trying to attack targets in Russia before. It's used drone attacks, things like that. Do they have any significant impact on this uh, conflict at all? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, what we need to consider here is that both Russia and Ukraine, I think, um, are facing two critical challenges. The one is, of course, the lack of manpower, and both of them are struggling with manpower, irrespective of the twist they're putting on this. Both of them are struggling with manpower, and both of them are struggling with heavy better battlefield equipment. So that's, I think, the two drivers of the conflict at the moment, right? So for Ukraine, um, their focus and their strategy to to sort of work past those two uh, challenges, I think, is um, two, a two-pronged strategy. The one is to focus on the naval and maritime domain, and of course, the other is to focus on the uh, air power or then the dronification of the war. And yeah, we have seen uh, that uh, Ukraine have, have done um, quite good in the last couple of weeks uh, through their attacks specifically on um, Russian oil infrastructure. I think they believe that uh, that's perhaps Russia's weak point. And of course, it ties nicely into the the uh, West's more general sort of sanction strategy against uh, against Ukraine uh, against Russia. So. The decision by Ukraine to lower the age of conscription, and I have to say I was surprised it was so high. I mean, I think in most countries where there is conscription and our sort of history of it, it's usually men or young people from the age of 18. They're forced into the military. In Ukraine, which is a country at war, it was only 27. I mean, that that must have an impact on the battlefield. You're dealing with soldiers who are much older than I would have expected. Yeah, well, you, you you need to understand that I don't think there's at the moment much to conscript in that age anymore. I think they are relying um, on volunteers at the moment. Uh, in fact, we know that, um, that the average age of the Ukraine soldier is quite deep in the 30s at, at the moment. So I think this is more a, a sort of a propaganda issue than a, a real conscription issue. And yeah, the manpower that you are looking for, uh, normally um, conscription age between 16 and 36. And so uh, I won't make too much of this. Uh, for me, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a propaganda issue at the moment. Um, let me just say perhaps something about Russia's strategy at the moment, because Russia, of course, is also lacking manpower. It's also lacking in heavy, heavy equipment. And so Russia's, stra- uh, uh, Russia's strategy is also unfolding in a, in a true two-pronged approach at the moment. The one is also to attack um, 
um, the Ukraine's infrastructure with standoff weapons um, using drone type and, uh, and deep strike artillery. And then, of course, we have seen a tremendous uh, information warfare campaign from the Russian side. You know, um, in, in fact, I want to say the Russian strategy that matters most is not Moscow's war fighting strategy, but rather the, uh, the, the Kremlin strategy to cause us to see the world as it wishes us to see it. And, and then to make decisions in that Kremlin generated alternative reality that will uh, allow Russia to, to win the real war. And I think that's Russia's center of gravity at, at the moment in, in this war. Professor Abel Yersteza, thank you very much indeed. Professor of Strategy at the Faculty of Military Science at the University of Stellenbosch. 27 minutes after six. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Good morning. I'd ask what happened to Kaiser Chiefs, but I know. Yes, in the spirit of sportsmanship, you know, you won't ask because they were shattered yesterday and uh, it was thanks to a moment of brilliance from Stellenbosch FC's Devon Titus. He netted the only goal of the match, vaulting Stellenbosch FC into a prime spot for Champions League qualification. Here's their coach, Steve Barker. Yeah, so I just cannot speak highly enough of this group of players. Um, you know, I think it's now 19 games unbeaten, of which 15 are wins. Um, you know, and I think you can see out there that the effort that they put in, I think they deserve everything that they're getting. A massive, massive result for us uh, to get um, into the position we are um, and solidify that second position with nine games left for us to play. Meanwhile, Mamelodi Sundowns edged out Richards Bay with a dramatic late goal by Junior Menieta, keeping their substantial lead at the summit of the table. In Polakwale, the matchday spectacle was at the Peter Mokaba Stadium, where Sekakuna United and Cape Town City battled to a pulsating two-all draw. Lastly, Amazulu and Polakwana City shared the spoils in Durban as neither side could break the deadlock in a tightly contested match. Elsewhere, Morgan Gibbs-White inspired Nottingham Forest to a 3-1 home win over Fulham to partly ease Nunu Espiritu Santo's side's Premier League relegation fears. And Dominic Calvert-Lewin came off the bench to score a late penalty and earn Everton a vital one-all draw against Newcastle at St. James Park. Rugby now, the Blitzbok playmaker, Devald Human is back from injury and is ready to help and make a difference to the Springbok Sevens fortunes in Hong Kong this weekend. Returning to the popular Far East stop on the HSBC 7 series will be special for the fleet-footed 28 years old as he led the Blitzbok to Hong Kong in 2018 when a young team laden with future talent surprised all and sundry by claiming third place. It's very important for me to be back in the team. Uh, yeah, I think my role uh, as, a, as a leader and a, and a playmaker is, is very important this weekend, uh, just to, to lead the guys on the field and off the field as well. So yeah, being back is nice. Uh, I like, like the spark in the team, like the new uh, dynamics in the team. But yeah, excited for the weekend. Uh, I think we, we need to prove South Africa uh, to give them something back. Uh, we, we disappointed the jersey a, a few months. So, but yeah, excited and, and, and you can see the guys how they train as well. More sport, top of the hour on Sunrise. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. Coming up in the next half hour, uh, we will look at the issue around local government where the municipal managers should each be given a bodyguard. That's coming up. You with SFM leading the conversation. It's no load shedding for the moment, just gone 6.30. Thank you, Stephen. In your headlines, the Electoral Court has until the 9th of this month to determine the appeal of the Umkonto Wesizwe Party's challenge of the Electoral Commission's disqualification of the former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate in the May 29th elections. Last week, the Commission upheld a member of the public's objection against Zuma, who served part of his 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. Parliament's Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services has confirmed that it has halted the process to select the next deputy public protector. This after a legal opinion found that the committee's EFF member, Advocate Dibusisio Mkwebane, failed to declare conflict of interest with two of the candidates, Advocate Shadrach Debeile and Ponatsekho Mgaladi. And Electricity Minister Dr. Josien Soramokhopa says the government is determined to address the impact of rolling blackouts. ESCOM has suspended rolling blackouts until further notice. I'll have details on these and other stories at 7. 
SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Start in uh, Pumalanga with an um, update on some protesting. It's on the 536. This is the route that goes from Hazyview in and out of the uh, Kruger Gate area. A little place along that route uh, called uh, Cork, and that's where uh, the protesting is this morning. So some obstruction on that Kruger uh, Gate road. You may well find some delays and diversions across the course of the day around that uh, particular obstruction. Uh, pedestrians being knocked down on the R21, leaving the airport heading through to Pretoria. It's northbound just after the Bobsontane exit. Uh, the right lane is currently closed off there. Uh, Pretoria's Dustport Tunnel, quite heavy on Bremer Street. Once you get south of Funderhof into the uh, tunnel area, that's uh, just pressure and traffic that's built up through there. Uh, the Phoenix exits, um, both uh, JG Champion from Palmview and the Phoenix Highway out towards Trade Centre. Both of those uh, routes uh, busy this morning. And Cape Town, as the schools go back across the nation, you can see uh, just actually busier traffic conditions. The N1 inbound from Belleville all the way through to Cuba. Going to change the N2 from the airport to Hospital Bend. Uh, the M5 already bottlenecking coming up from Kenilworth towards that end too. And there's a lot of pressure out of Mitchell's play in the M7 queuing from Highlands Drive up through the R300 and then a secondary queue all the way through uh, towards the Govan and Becky Road Bridge area. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The Business Update on SAFM. Our business show host, Jimmy Moyaha, with us this week. Jimmy, good morning. How are you doing? Morning, Stephen. Well, thanks. How are you? All right, good. Asian markets, US markets, how are they looking? Uh, let's start with U.S. markets because there's a lot happening in Asia. U.S. markets finished the day in the green, yet, in the red yesterday. Sorry, with the Nasdaq down a percent, with the Dow down a percent, and the S&P down three quarters of a percent. We expected that those losses would then track into the performance of Asian markets, uh, but there's been a couple of new developments from the Asian markets as well. We'll start in Sydney. That's down about 1.2% at the moment, uh, with Hong Kong down 0.7%, so three quarters of a percent there. Uh, uh, Yes, Tokyo down about two thirds of a percent as well. The developments uh, from the Asian side of it, there's been an earthquake in Taiwan that has severely affected the market sentiment at the moment. A 7.5 magnitude earthquake has forced companies like uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company to evacuate its factories um, and that's giving the markets a bit of jitters and a bit of concerns. Alongside that, we've got uh, concerns around the F, uh, the, the U.S. Fed uh, coming through from a rates decision point of view, and that's driving a lot of the sentiment uh, in Asian markets. So Asian markets at the moment are in the red uh, for the bulk of that. We're seeing that the gold price is tracking the sensitivity of the markets, and that is increasing at the moment. So uh, if we look at that, that's sitting closer to the $2,300 level uh, per ounce there, and that's largely off the back of the concerns and the risk sentiment there. It's up about 3% at the moment. Brent crude is also at around $88.29 uh, a barrel there, and the price of Platinum and palladium is also moving up slightly here. So we're seeing that the effect of this uncertainty from a, a rates decision point of view and a markets point of view is driving a lot of the sentiment at the moment. If we just have a quick summary at some of the rest of uh, the Asian markets, uh, we've got the Philippines market down about a percent as well. We've got the Indian Nifty down about a tenth of a percent. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, the Hong Kong market down almost uh, three quarters of a percent are there, with South Korea down a full percent at the moment. So we'll keep an eye on the developments uh, out of Taiwan and see how that's going to be affecting the markets. But generally, sentiment is that it's going to be a red day. And then a quarter one performance from Tesla, that's affected markets in Asia. Yes. So yesterday we spoke about uh, Xiaomi being or stepping into the EV space and announcing that they will be uh, producing an, uh, an electric vehicle. We saw that Tesla reported Q1 numbers in terms of deliveries, and those deliveries missed estimates by quite uh, some margin. They were expected to deliver more than 400,000 vehicles. They came in at around 390,000 vehicles. And as a result of that, Asian uh, new electronic vehicle manufacturers have also come off uh, in anticipation of the fact that there might be a bit of a slowdown in demand uh, off the back of the the Tesla numbers. Obviously, Tesla being the leader in the EV space, a lot of what happens from their business does tend to spill over into the markets, and we're starting to see that now. So at the moment, uh, EV companies in the uh, Asian markets, particularly in the Chinese markets, are seeing a slowdown in the performance, largely off the back of what's happened with the Tesla stock. Jimmy Mayaha, thank you very much indeed. Our business show host back, of course, in an hour. 24 minutes now to 7. Africa Update on SAFM Sunrise. A continental overview of current African affairs. Rest Advocate Sipo Mantula, good morning.
It's an amazing story in Senegal. Someone needs to start the miniseries now because you have an opposition leader. He was in jail just a couple of weeks ago, and now he's president. Stephen, yesterday we know it was the inauguration of uh, Baserio Diomaye Fai. Others they say Diomaye means the honorable one in the local Serre language. Now, yesterday it is uh, interesting, it was outside the capital city of Dakar. And now what will happen now is a formal handover from the outgoing President Macky Sali, which will take place at the presidential palace. As you have alluded, coming from prison to the presidential palace. Interestingly, he has already committed that he will reform Senegal. Those are the promises he has given to the young voters uh, when uh, he was elected uh, last month. Now, remember, they say fire is Sonko. So we don't know what will happen in the politics of Senegal, whether Sonko will be behind the scenes, because he might not be uh, appointed due to his criminal record, but he might be behind the scenes uh, as Sonko, I mean, as fire is promising to deal with also the issue of the francophone uh, uh, influence in West Africa. But also ECOWAS, Stephen, like I said yesterday, Bola Tinubo was in Senegal. It would be interesting to hear what was Senegal foreign policy towards ECOWAS revival and also the issues that are happening in the continent as well as in the global affairs. It will be interesting to get this foreign policy, Ediomaye, Faye, Pasmiro. And then in Egypt, the president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, sworn in for a third six-year term. I mean, he was re-elected, Jish, back in December. That is quite true with 89.6%, Stephen, with a uh, turnout of 66%, almost 67 million registered voters. But one is amazed that after so long, Stephen, only inauguration yesterday. But remember, during that time, also the Israel and uh, uh, Middle East conflict also erupted and threatening uh, the Rafa region and also the eastern border of Egypt. So you can see that his presidency was, was not on a good landing, it was on a tough landing. Yes, yesterday, uh, he, he took office before parliament. They in a new administrative capital in the desert outside Cairo. So it appears that this is moving towards the desert, Stephen. We don't know what are the reasons, but we know that there are still challenges on the Middle East that he's trying to intervene. He's back in office for another six years. And then in Somalia, um, the state, it's known as Puntland, sort of semi-autonomous, it's withdrawn from the country's federal system. You know, put. Puntland, for our listeners, they need to know it was autonomous state since 1998, Stephen. It was, it was part of the federal Somalia. Now, they are worried about this uh, constitutional amendment that has happened, that uh, the president, Hassan Sheikh, will now directly appoint the prime minister. So they are saying that they are moving out of the government until there's a nationwide referendum, because there appears that that parliamentary constitutional amendment was done illegal, so they will rather... Uh, stay independent and they reject those uh, latest constitutional reforms in Somaliland, in Somalia parliament. And then in Kenya, uh, public hospital doctors, they've been on strike. What's the latest there? Stephen, nothing new. You know, it is uh, now going for the third week and and issues are very important for President Ruto and his minister in uh, health. Uh, Minister Suzanne Nakuchima uh, to say, how do you deal with this crisis of 2017 on a failed collective bargaining agreement that has also put 7,000 doctors who went on a strike since March, Stephen, demanding a few things, uh, increase on their salaries, um, immediate hiring of the doctors who come from um, nursing colleges, who come in from university colleges. Uh, and that's what is worrying because there is a lot of money in Kenya, but they are not spending it in the health sector, Stephen. And we know what happened also in 2017, like I said earlier. But this is a crisis that is facing uh, President Ruto and his Minister of Health, Susan uh, Nakuchima, that he has to deal with the crisis in Nairobi. And then you're taking us back to the 3rd of April, 1930. Stephen, it's 24 years ago when uh, Tafari Makwenen or Rastafari Makwenen Haile Selassie was um, crowned as the uh, king of Ethiopia on this day, 1930, succeeding and permanently important for the system of governance and education in Ethiopia that started in 1930 uh, during the reign of Emperor Haile Selassie, as the founding father also of the Organization of African Unity that was formed in 1963. Asante Sana SG, as was still leading the conversation, SAFM observing the Freedom Month. Rest Advocate Sipo Mantulap, thank you very much indeed. Back tomorrow, more news, of course, from our continent through the day here on SAFM. 19 minutes to 7. Call us on 086 000 2032.
Well, that's the number. We do expect developments today in the National Assembly speaking of Vuma Peace and Gakula. Not entirely sure what to expect, but let's see how it plays out. You heard about the NPA charging Visvin Reddy with incitement to violence over his comments uh, as in support of Umkontu Wissizu and former President Jacob Zuma. But there's been the issue around the University of Fort Hare as well. And of course, SARS getting more money than it th- than it thought it would get um, and that the target that the target was set for it. Well, voice notes coming through, including uh, the this morning, around the former public protector, the EFF MP, Busasim Kobane. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Stephen. It's Ifi here from Guyane, Kamayepu. Uh, Stephen, I think Busasim Kobane should just uh, recuse herself. There's a lot of conflict of interest in this matter. She just have to. They just have to appoint someone and then let her be on the other side. Thank you, Stephen. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, these were the conversations around uh, who would be the new deputy public protector. And the claim is, well, the findings actually being that she is indeed conflicted because she's sort of, you know, one of the candidates is representing her as a lawyer. And one of the other candidates was fired by her when she was the public protector. So there's a lot going on there, as you can imagine. All right. You know the number 86 2032 It's 17 minutes now to 7 o'clock. Stephen Kruetes on SAFM. Well, in the aftermath of last week's shooting incident at the Umklatuzi municipality in KwaZulu-Natal, the Institute for Local Government Management is calling for councils to be allowed to provide at least one protector, one bodyguard, to municipal managers. So, last week, and we're still trying to get to the bottom of what happened, but the bodyguard of the Umklatuzi mayor, Kalani Nguezi, allegedly shot and killed Simuzulu who was the protector for the municipal manager in Kosenia Zulu. At the same time last week, the Joburg Council voted to make it easier for each councillor to get a bodyguard that I'm presuming would be paid for by the state. The president of the Institute for Local Government Management is Max Mbili. Max, good morning. Thanks for your time. Uh, good morning, Stephen, and your, your listeners. Why do you believe each municipal manager should be given a bodyguard? Firstly, uh, Stephen, uh, we would want to uh, register our heartfelt and deepest condolences uh, to the bereaved family for the incident that has taken place at the uh, city of um- Umshatuze. Then going back to your, 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 your question, uh, this is our call uh, for the last uh, uh, seven years to the Minister of, of, of Kronka, uh, the environment, Stephen, uh, for, for us as municipal managers or senior managers is, 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 is not conducive. Uh, the decisions that we, we take uh, time to time um, may be regarding a uh, procurement, will, will uh, invite uh, an, an unnecessary um, uh, incidents in, 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 in municipalities. Uh, we are making this call because we, we have buried uh, a number of um, members of the institute, uh, municipal managers, uh, CFOs, and, and other sen- senior managers. So we feel that um, at the, the environment, we will need that our municipal managers and other senior officials where threats ha- has been uh, detected are, are given security. So that, that is our view. Uh, it is not a view that we should celebrate, but the conditions demand that we must make this call. Okay, I can understand, Max, and I can imagine the pressure you're under. I mean, you represent people in this space, and it's becoming more and more dangerous. Certainly, it seems like it. So I understand why you say what you say. Um, In this case, it was the bodyguard of a mayor who shot dead the bodyguard of a municipal manager. Clearly, something happened between them, or there was something else going on. But what I'm trying to get to is... Would more armed people walking around not lead to more violence like we saw here? This was two bodyguards. Yes, Stephen, what, what, what we need to understand, we, we are not making this call because of, the, of, of this incident. We, we are saying this incident validates a, our, our call for, for security managers, for, 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 for senior managers, because we, we are saying as the Institute, at, at the space where the incident has taken place, we are worried about that space, uh, municipal environment space. So the incident validates our, our call. We are not saying because it, it happened. We are now making a call. call has been made more than seven years ago. 
Where do you think this is coming from? Okay, so is there a broken politics? Maybe the case in Mklatuze. Is there a situation like we saw he wasn't a municipal manager, but uh, he was someone who worked in the water space. I forget his name now, unfortunately, but he was shot dead at a big public event in Joburg just a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago now. This was someone who already had bodyguards, and they had bodyguards because they were making decisions about who received certain contracts. So, I mean, is this just criminality? Is it politics? Is it both that's led to this terrible situation where you have to make a call and I'm nodding along as you speak, Max, because it's so bad. Okay. As the body, we are calling for the professionalization of local government space. So so that that is our call as the institute because we are seeing a, a, a political interference in the administration we, we, we feel that um, most of these incidents uh, are caused by the fact that you, you, you can't see a line in, in most municipalities uh, between the administration and, 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 our, and our politicians. So, so we are saying we are calling for, the, for that professionalization so that the administrators will, will be allowed to, to implement the policies that have been decided upon. By, by, by politicians. Remember, uh, our political principles, uh, uh, they, they, their role is, is to uh, decide on, on, on policies, is to uh, play an oversight in terms of implementation. So our role as administrators is implementation. So for us, there should be no, there should be no conflict because in terms of roles, mm -hmm. it is clear who should be doing what. But, but you see a, a lot of um, a, a, a politics uh, that cause many of these problems. Hence, we, 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 with the force, we are making this call. We know that money that is used uh, to, to pay uh, protectors, some of that money should be used for service delivery. We are aware. But, but the uh, material conditions on the ground, they demand that we, we, we make this call. Sure. No, I understand. Um, Max, uh, you, you talk about the professionalization of the space. And I mean, I, yeah. I, I think most people would agree with you. Um, do you think the politicians agree with you? I mean, they're not going to want to give up their control, are they? And they get they benefit from the kind of control that they have. And we see this all the time. Yes, you see, in, in our engagements, uh, everyone agrees that we, we, we need to professionalize the space. All, all of us. But the issue is about implementation, uh, the, the content, the content of this uh, professionalization. So where where we we face problems, while we agree when when we are discussing this matter, when we come to implementation, we do have a problem. For for, for example, Stephen, in the, in terms of the legislation, uh, procurement of 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 the state, uh, the responsible person. Is, is accounting officer who is who is a municipal manager, right? Uh, assisted assisted by appointed committees in, in the municipality. But but how many times have you heard that mm. it is a conflict between uh, municipal managers and and, and political sure. principals who would want to say who should get a tender? Mm. How how many times? Yeah. So the issue the, the issue is about political will. For, for, for this professionalization. We're not, we're not saying only, only politicians. We are saying to our members, because they, they also sign a code of conduct, we are saying to them, they must also uh, stick, stick to their lane when they do these mm. things. It, 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 it must be above board. It, 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 there must be transparency. Sure. There, must, there must be finance. So that, that is why we are calling for this professionalization. If we, we, we have implement mm. implemented this professionalization uh, 30 years ago mm. we wouldn't be here okay. calling for protectors for municipal managers max and billy thank you just shows you how serious the situation is max and billy's the president of the institute for local government management nine minutes to seven safm
Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Quite heavy getting into Pretoria this morning. If you use the N4 and you come into Pretoria Street down into Hatfield, there's been a crash near Jan Schober, and that's quite a heavy backlog. Uh, traffic effectively queuing from the N1, N4 highway uh, all the way into the Hatfield area. Pretoria bad, looking very slow. Also crash on the M1 south near uh, Samrand Road. So coming through Brockfontein Interchange on your way uh, through Centurion to Midrand, being held up quite badly there. And quite a nasty taxi crash at Bridal Park between Midrand Blue Hills and and Dipslet on the 562 Summit Road, causing a backlog. Uh, lights around on Winnie Mandela and Monte Cassino. Also, Winnie Mandela and Sloan is an issue as well. So, coming out of four ways, it's very busy. Uh, lots of lights out on Malabongwe Drive through North Riding towards the M1 Highway. As we go back to school, the volumes increase and Malabongwe is quite heavy this morning if you're around Bergbau. Uh, leaving Peter Maransberg, a broken down truck near Market Road, causing a backlog coming off the Peter Maransberg Bypass. Traffic pushing back towards sort of, uh, New England Road territory. The M7 towards the Bluff, queuing down to Bel Air and Wakesley Road. And Cape Town, Marine Drive back queuing again this morning. It's been absent this queue since, uh, well, during school holidays, but no schools reopened for a new term. So does the traffic come back on Marine Drive Bayside uh, through Sunset Beach looking heavy. And the highways are fairly busy as well. M3 already queuing from Constantia through towards uh, Paradise Road. And the N1 pretty heavy across all lanes this morning from Belleville all the way through uh, Sable Road through Cooper get a change and down towards the Marine Drive on Ram. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Did you know that government has set a minimum amount for employers to pay their employees and workers? In 2018, the National Minimum Wage Act 09 of 2018 was passed in South Africa. It makes it compulsory for all employers to pay employees and workers a minimum wage. In 2024, the national minimum wage for all workers, including domestics, farm and forestry workers, is 27 rands 58 cents per hour. The minimum wage for workers on the expanded public works program, EPWP, is 15 rands 16 cents. If your employer is not paying you the national minimum wage, please contact a labor inspector at a labor center near you. The Department of Employment and Labor, working for you. Masanda wanna trust their creativity to ensure Yanga gets nothing from Zanzi's capital city. But the gentlemen from the east want to leave Gabuyelo in tears. This is the second leg quarterfinal battle of the CAF Champions League. Experience Africa's beautiful game, Mami Lodi Sundowns versus Young Africans, on Friday, 5 April at 8 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. SAFM values your views. Be an active citizen. Well, your view on bodyguards for municipal managers, and of course, some councillors have bodyguards too. There's been calls around that. 86 And it's a Queenie meetings between ratepayers and the municipality about the administration's or the city's proposed integrated development plan. They've been postponed. Residents say they need more time to look at the plan, and there have been huge issues between ratepayers and the Itaquini administration. There's been a lack, issues around a lack of service has problems with the budget in the past as well. Terry McClarty is the chair of the Umklanga Ratepayers and Residents Association. Terry, good morning. Good morning to you and to your many viewers and listeners. When you, do you believe that the, the draft integrated development plan, is it the right kind of plan? Would it improve lives for people living in Etiquini at the moment? Well, if you consider that a lot of people in Ethiquini are below the breadline and they cannot afford this budget and these increases that are being levied, and they haven't been considered very well in terms of the service delivery, then we do not agree with it one little bit. We do not accept it. We think it has been badly put together, and we have requested um, a roundtable discussion to try and give some sense and some information back into this budget to get it to be more effective and more reasonable. So for you, most people won't afford it and it won't make their lives better? Absolutely not. There's, there's very little in terms of infrastructure which is failing and um, and a lot of bonuses for staff and um, incentives for people. And I mean, at the moment, this municipality in Ethiquini is not um, succeeding at what they should be giving us. Um, the service delivery is shocking. Uh, we've had water issues. We've had... Um, strikes, as you're aware, um, a lot of political motivation. And as the ratepayers, we are saying the ratepayers are apolitical. We do not accept that there's politics in municipal 
mm. governance in the local government. What kind of measures do you believe Etiquini should follow? Where do you think the focus should be? How should they pay for what needs to happen? Well, first of all, um, we do understand that there's a lot of um, reckless spending, perhaps um, un- unnecessary expenditure in the budget. And we want to see the infrastructure sorted, and we need help from municip- from uh, provincial and national government to sort this out. Our, our tourism industry in Mshlanga particular uh, is that damaged from the um, sewage mm. and um, and effluent running into the water, into the sea. So the beaches are closed continually. Um, that's not good for the businesses in this area. We we've always been a holiday destination. And um, and we've had a really bad, bad time. Terry McClarty, thank you. The chair of the Umflanga Ratepayers and Residents Association. Call us on 86 To Tabisa and Polokwani, hi. You've been listening around SARS this morning. They, 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 they beat their target. Go for it, Tabiso. No, 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 Stephen. Uh, it, it's important also to, you know, uh, uh, to say to, to the guys at SARS, particularly led by uh, Keith Sweater, that they've done a very good work. Mm. And I mean, I've, I've, I've went through their presentation. It clearly shows that there was a point, and I think it was reflected in the Nigerian Commission, to say that they had lost about 3,000 or so yeah. of some of their skilled employees. But uh, for them to recover like this, although they are mm. identifying other issues to say, they're still working mm. quite very hard to make sure that uh, they, 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 they are stable. Mm. Uh, it's something that we need to acknowledge, Stephen. I mean, we are talking in, any, in an environment where most of our SOCs and most of our internet collapsed. Yeah. And we, know what, uh, we know what happened. So it's important that if institutions like SARS, which uh, cut our democracy and people are doing very uh, good work that they are doing, we need to applaud them and say they must keep up. And I hope that those that have been brought to other institutions to make sure that they are, uh, this other institution do well, they are watching and learning the good mm. work that is being done that side. I mean, it's important to remember institutions can recover. Uh, it's important to remember that, isn't it? Exactly, exactly, exactly. They can, definitely, if you put the right mm. people. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it looks like, uh, with regard to SARS, uh, uh, a, a good song has been found in that particular yeah. regard. And uh, hopefully, in other, in other areas, we'll see a bit of improvement yeah. here and there. It will be very difficult, of course. Uh, but uh, it will be very, it, 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 mm. it, it, it's something that we are, we are looking forward to. Tabis from Polakwani, thank you. Moses, and, <laughs> Mo- Moses, 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 won't you switch me off, Moses? I know you're probably driving at the moment. All right, I think Moses is back with us now. Uh, Moses, hi, you're in Bramley. The bodyguard issue, go for it. Hey, Stephen, uh, we've got a problem in this country. We definitely regretted uh, the fact that we removed uh, some people who were leaving us with no killings of one mm. another. But since this turn of democracy, that we definitely hope things will turn to better for most of us. But we are seeing misery in this country. I think we must crack this standard, really, and, 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 and they go back to a day whereby people, government has people who to do job, mm. not tender. Because people are just killing one another mm. for this standard. And this guy is telling you about the implementation. Mm. This is the last word he's telling you now, thing. Mm. That implementation, what, 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 what. I think it, it's useless to, to go on and on interviewing these people because they don't have any plan. It looks like everything this government from the people who were leading us nicely without killing, without anything. But since the dawn of this democracy, it's a misery in this country. Yeah. Let's grab the tenders and go back to, 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 mm. to, to, to a day whereby we used to have a, a public works people who mm. work for government. But sure. this thing, I man, I man, I wanna let's go and vote and, and fit with change and put people who will be leading us with the okay. I mean, okay, Moses, are, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Moses, I hear you. Thank you. You were there, SFM, leading the conversation at 7 o'clock.
Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, all eyes on the Electoral Court to settle the Zuma candidature saga. And Taiwan deals with a devastating earthquake. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luyanda Maume. We begin with some election-related news. The Electoral Court has until the 9th of this month to determine the appeal of the Umkondo Wesizwe Party's challenge of the Electoral Commission's disqualification of former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate in the May 29th elections. Last week, the Commission upheld a member of the public's objections against Zuma, who served part of his 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. MK Party spokesperson Tamulo Ntlele says they believe that they have strong grounds on which to challenge the commission's disqualification of Zuma. President Zuma uh, was not incarcerated off the back of what would be section 35 of the constitution where you ought to be before a judge and have a fair trial. Uh, President Zuma was incarcerated uh, by a constitution court uh, without having been afforded you know uh, his constitutional rights to a fair trial. So um, we cannot necessarily label it as a criminal case you know he all he did was contempt of what would be contempt of court and that is not a criminal case it's more so a civil matter um, and the IEC act refers to a criminal matter so there's a number of nuances that ought to be looked into here Parliament's Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services has confirmed that it has halted the process to select the next deputy public protector. This after a legal opinion found that the committee's EFF member, Advocate Busisio Mkwebane, failed to declare a conflict of interest with two of the candidates, Advocates Shadrach Tebeile and Bonatsejo Mughaladi. Tebeile represents Mkwebane in an ongoing court case while Mughaladi works for the Office of the Public Protector and Mkwebane once dismissed her. Parliament's legal advisor is Zingisa Zenani. Our view is that whether or not Advocate Mukwebane is a strong decision maker in the process is irrelevant to the consideration of refusal as both the National Assembly rules and the codes speak to a personal other than political interest in the, in the matter at hand. If Advocate Mukwebane persists with her view that it is not appropriate for her to refuse herself in the circumstances, we are of the view that any party that is aggrieved mm-hmm. by such a decision will have a right to approach a court of law to have such dispute decided accordingly. The National Assembly rules do not provide for any process or a process of complaint compelling a member to reduce themselves. However, failure to do so would potentially result in a breach of the court. Electricity Minister Dr. Josien Suramukhupa says the government is determined to address the impact of rolling blackouts. ESCOM has suspended rolling blackouts until further notice. This is due to the sustained generation capacity, adequate emergency reserves and lower electricity demand. Ramukhupa says he's pleased with ESCOM's current improved generation capacity. He was speaking in Kabecha in the Eastern Cape yesterday. Today we are visiting uh, the DSA, which is uh, one of our peaking uh, power stations. Uh, um, of course, the peakers uh, means that uh, we, we call on them to help us to reduce the intensity of, uh, of load shedding. So it's important that we have an appreciation of uh, how the peakers are performing. If you put the, the DSA on its own, it generates about uh, 335 uh, uh, megawatts, uh, two units, and then uh, it's a sister plant to Avon, that is in case at end. The two of them put together is just over a thousand, a thousand megawatts. So- Health Minister Dr. Joe Pasha says it's miraculous that the only survivor in the best bus crash in which 45 people were killed in Limpopo sustained minor injuries. He and the Limpopo Health MEC Dr. Popi Ramatuba visited the 8-year-old girl at the Mukupane Hospital yesterday. The bus was transporting people from Khaboroni, Botswana to the St. Engenas Zion Christian Church in Limpopo for the Easter pilgrimage when the crash happened on Thursday last week. Pasha says the girl is recovering well and could would soon be discharged from hospital. We are very grateful for the child. We have said we went to see the child is doing well. A miracle, it's a, it's a real miracle that the child survived without any breaking of bones, just minor scratches and wounds which, which will heal. The child should be able to, to can go home. 
And finally, an earthquake with a 7.4 strength on the Richter scale has struck an area of the coast of Taiwan. A tsunami warning has been issued for nearby Japanese islands of, uh, of the southern prefecture of Okinawa. The authorities have ordered the evacuation from coastal areas. Video footage from the Taiwanese capital Taipei showed some large buildings tilting. The BBC's Shaima Khalil reports from Tokyo. It's the biggest earthquake that has been reported for more than two decades. One thing I'll say from where I am right now in Japan is that I have been to Okinawa. I have been to some of these islands. They are very close to Taiwan. So an earthquake with that kind of magnitude would affect Okinawa and would affect the Japanese islands and, of course, the Philippines quite strongly. And this is why authorities here are on high alert, especially given how strong the earthquake is. Recapping your top story, the Electoral Court has, an, has until the 9th of this month to determine the appeal of the Umkondo Wesizwe Party's challenge of the IEC's disqualification of former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate in the May 29th elections. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 7.30. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sunrise Sports. Mamelodi Sundowns clinch a narrow victory over Riches Bay amidst a night of thrilling soccer action, while the Springbok women gear up to take on Ireland in the HSBC Hong Kong Sevens Rugby Tournament. Full roundup just before 7.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Ah, well, sorry about that. Good morning. Seven minutes after seven. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Curtis. Plenty to come. We'll hear uh, from Rob Byrne uh, in the next little while. Sorry about uh, the uh, uh, interruption to your normal transmission. All right. A lot more to come in the next little while. Uh, we'll find out a bit more about these uh, charges that have been laid against uh, Visvan Reddy and the claims against him that he's guilty of inciting violence for the comments he made about the elections. Also, more on SARS. How did they do it? Where did the extra money come from? What did this tell us? What does this tell us? about uh, compliance, all of those things. I think that's what's really important. Uh, that's what we'll be looking at in the next little while. Also to come from 8.30 this morning, the issue of immigration and migration. So many people claim that South Africans are coming back to South Africa. That's not really what the evidence says. The numbers seem to point to something different. So we'll have a look at that as well. I think that that's really interesting. So we'll be looking at that. Eight minutes now after seven o'clock. Masanda want to trust their creativity to ensure Yanga gets nothing from Zanzi's capital city. But the gentlemen from the east want to leave Gabuyelo in tears. This is the second leg quarterfinal battle of the CAF Champions League. Experience Africa's beautiful game, Mami Lodi Sundowns versus Young Africans, on Friday 5 April at 8pm. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. The easiest way to sell your car by far. First in the morning, morning. SAFM Sunrise with Stephen Grutis. Nine minutes after seven, we'll plenty to come in the next little while. We'll get a view on the situation we've been seeing uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. The sort of comments, can I call them war talk? Some of them uh, really quite strong comments. Also, of course, the effectiveness of SARS. That's an important conversation. And we're watching very closely the situation around the National Assembly Speaker, Nosaviuma Pisa Ngakula. No certainty yet on what's going to happen there. We are trying her people just to see if there's any movement on that. I imagine it'll all become clear as we go through the morning together. Well, later today, the leader of the ADEC party and member of Mkunta Wisiswe, Visvan Reddy, will appear in the Chatsworth Magistrates Court on charges of inciting violence during the election. Reddy has said that if MK loses certain court cases, there will be riots like you've never seen before. He also said the elections would not happen. And we've seen a series of comments suggesting there could be violence or maybe threatening violence during the elections, particularly it seems to me in Kwazi Natal. Professor Becky Mgumazulu is director at the Centre for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at Nelson Mandela University. Professor Mgumazulu, good morning. Thanks for your time. 
Uh, good morning, good Steve, and good morning to your listeners, and thank you for having me. We've seen violent speech, I don't know, war talk may be another English phrase for it, but we've seen this kind of language for quite a long time during this election. We're now seeing someone being charged with breaking the law around this. Is this a good move by the NPA? Uh, in a way, it's a good move in the sense that uh, you don't want a bloodbath and you also don't want an election uh, to be tarnished by violence and uh, any, anything related to that. But the question is, before you even come to people making those utterances, the question is, how did we get here? In other words, what are the causal factors? What triggers people to make such statements? Is it because uh, someone is not abiding by the law or implementing the law as should be the case? Or is it because people are just excited about a new party? So those are the critical questions that um, for me need uh, um, uh, attention uh, before uh, we, we even start arresting people for inciting violence. Of course, we cannot correct something by bringing up something that is also wrong. You can, uh, two wrongs never make right. So we cannot condone any statements that trigger violence. But on the same tone, we cannot uh, appreciate uh, what people do, uh, which then um, uh, incites people to make such statements. So on both ends, I think there is something that needs to be corrected. Is one of the reasons people make these comments the fact that they're uh, never held legally accountable for it? They say it because they can. Uh, in a way, but part, part of the reason is because of the inconsistencies we've been seeing, both starting in Parliament, uh, inconsistencies in Parliament, and also inconsistencies in our courts of law, which means you and I can commit the same crime, but the end result is not the same. So that is where the problem starts. And people are, are, are smart. They can watch this from a distance. They identify loopholes, and then they say, uh, if, if you understand the saying that what is good for the goose is good for the gander, then it means that if Steve is wrong uh, because he has done A, B, C, D, Peggy must also be found wrong for having done exactly the same thing. Mm. You cannot have two people committing the same crime and then only to find that the end result is not the same. So both Parliament and our judiciary are partly to blame for all of the things that we are talking about right now. I mean, there are other factors in our society too, Professor Mgomazulu, aren't there? I mean, yesterday... Kasatu issued a statement welcoming the decision by the NPA to charge Visfan Reddy. But for years, its leaders stood on podiums while former President Jacob Zuma sang about his machine gun. And I can imagine the huge argument you would have around uh, uh, figurative speech or metaphors or what is violence and what isn't violence. But the point is that you know, uh, and this goes to maybe a greater point that we're trying to make here, is that you shouldn't use violence in speech at all. No, absolutely, absolutely, Stephen. And if uh, we were consistent in everything that we do, we wouldn't be talking about this thing right now. If, for example, anyone uh, who makes a statement that is uh, uh, interpreted to be inciting violence uh, is called to order, then we wouldn't have the next person repeating the same thing. If you have uh, a, a parliament that uh, responds to such issues in a consistent, consistent manner, wouldn't be where we are right now. If you had courts of law uh, interpreting such uh, uh, situations in the same manner and implementing the law in the same manner, wouldn't be where we are. So it all boils down to this, to this lack of consistency, which is in fact uh, caused by a number of reasons, some of which are political, others uh, have to do with financial incentives, others have to do with party citizenship and a lot of other things. So we are to blame for this situation. When someone is uh, facing the law, like the case we're talking about right now, this could have been avoided if uh, earlier incidences had been acted upon. But because there was no action, then this person said, okay, if so and so did it, I can't do it too, only to find that this time around uh, the law will start grinding, which then comes back to this issue of inconsistency. How important is leadership from all of the parties to lower the tensions? And we're talking about, uh, we may be talking about this MK example now. Three weeks, two weeks ago, you and I were uh, talking and I think a bit concerned about uh, the situation between the ANC and the IFP after that sort of uh, grabbing of the microphone incident by uh, Sibonis Duma, the MEC there. So how important is the tone that is set by leadership? 
No, it is very critical, my brother. The, the, the fact that uh, we have people we call leaders, it means that they have followers. Uh, so if you are a leader and then you start doing things that are unlawful and you make statements that are reckless, chances are your followers are going to believe in you because the reason why they elected you to be their leader is because they hold, they hold you in high esteem. So whatever you say, they take it seriously. Whatever you do, they take it seriously. So the onus is on leaders to lead properly. Unfortunately, there are people who became leaders by default. Uh, I said in one instance that uh, there are people who don't deserve to be leaders. Some are to climb on corpses to be leaders. Others are to exchange brown envelopes to be leaders. Others are to do a lot of other things. So you only see this uh, during crunch time when leaders are, are supposed to show leadership and they fail to do so. Then you know they were not supposed to be leaders in the first place. If people were leaders, they would read the political mood at the moment and then try to lead properly. In the event that they are not sure, they can seek advice from other people and then do the things the right way. Because if we continue the manner we're doing things, our country will be in trouble unnecessarily so. Professor Ngomazulo, you, you lead a center that tries to advance democracy. Um, and is it not, I mean, is it a sad fact of democracy that leaders can become leaders through claiming to speak for one group of people and thus dividing people? And this is a great example in the U.S. President Donald Trump, perhaps. But we start to see here the risk is that people become leaders, they get elected into positions through dividing people, which is one of the reasons they speak in this way. What I'm trying to get to is, is there a political incentive against them being peaceful? You, you know, Stephen, you're asking a very pertinent question. In fact, the center that I lead deals with two issues. One is the issue of racism, and then the other one is democracy. On the democracy front, we, 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 we have decided since I joined the center, I said we cannot operate alone. We need to collaborate with other people, which is why we're working closely with institutions like a democracy development program. We're working with many other institutions, both in the country and abroad, uh, to try and make sure that people are abide by the law, and then they advance democracy. And the way you advance democracy is to look at what the constitution of the country says and abide by that constitution. So if someone is in the wrong, you don't look at the face. You look at what the person has done, and then you act accordingly. And then what we normally do, whenever we bring together different stakeholders, we make sure that uh, we are mindful of the racial profile of the country. We bring in people from different backgrounds so that we can uh, preach the message <clears throat> to everyone, not to target one group. Because the moment you do that, uh, in some instances, you might, you might be preaching to those who are already converted and you leave others out there. So you have to be inclusive if you want to ensure that there is democratic consolidation and then you want to make sure also that the leaders understand what they are doing. Even if you became a leader by default, once you become a leader, the onus is on you to capacitate yourself. And then part of what we do then is to bring together different political parties and we try to reason with them, especially now during elections. We hold meetings uh, in, in PE or Kabeha where I'm based. We also hold meetings in Etewin or Deben where DDP is based and we bring in different political parties. We don't select political parties. Just say we invite all of them. Some decide not to come, others do come and we preach the same gospel. This is our country. Let us protect it. Professor Bekim Gomazulu, thank you very much indeed. Director of the Centre for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at Nelson Mandela University, 19 minutes after 7. At SFM Radio and at Stephen Grutus on Twitter. Well, confirmation from SARS yesterday that despite what I think we all accept as a slow economy, it was able to exceed its revised target by 10 billion rand. SARS able to bring in over 2.1 trillion rand, some of that money refunded in the form of VAT refunds. SARS says it's been able to increase the number of people who are compliant with their tax. In other words, more people, it would appear, are obeying the law when it comes to tax. But the commissioner, Edward Kiesvetter, does say he's worried about the VAT refund system and that it has scope for abuse. Professor Keith Engel is the CEO of the South African Institute of Taxation. Professor Engel, good morning. Morning. Firstly, how was SARS able to increase the amount of money that came in? What's changed? Let me put it like that. 
Well, I think they've changed their operational strategies like they planned. So there are a number of things they've done. Very heavily reliant on modern IT systems. So they're trying to push on third-party data. And the issue is that people don't disclose. The simplest way to un- lose collections is people just don't honestly report what they owe. So that's where you're trying. You're seeing a lot more on data, a lot more on documentation. And they're also trying to reach people outside the system. So one point that the commissioner mentioned was we're getting more people registered. So there were a lot of people who were just outside the registrar. Get them in the registrar, and then we can start seeing what's going on and looking at multiple data points. And then even the threat of that has made a number of people say, look, I see which way things are going, and me hiding in the shadows isn't going to work much longer. And so you also took note that a number of people are coming forward with voluntary disclosures. So when more people are compliant, I mean, that changes everything. It changes everything around the rule of law. It brings more people in. It brings more money for the fiscus. The point I'm trying to get to is, overall, this is very good news for the country. It's very good for news in the country about as a matter of fairness, because the complaint that was going on before was that you weren't really expanding the tax base. The, the illegal, just the, that guy next door got away with everything. And once you were on the system, you were forced to comply. And then the answer was, we're just going to keep raising the rates on the innocent. And that really made it very, very difficult for people and said, look, you know, why should I pay if the guy next door isn't paying? So it is good that everybody pays. We want to pay a little less, but that's not a SARS issue. It's a Treasury issue. But expanding the base and making sure everybody's fair is good for the system. Does it cost money to go after the people who are not paying the tax they're supposed to pay? It must cost SARS money to go and find all of these people. Well, that's right. And I think that's one of the big challenges that you have, and it's been there all along, is that it's easier to get people who are mostly compliant, people who normally file. You know, a passive revenue authority just looks at what they're getting. When you have to go beyond your normal systems and look at the people who are not coming forward, it requires a different effort. And that effort gets tougher. I mean, when you deal with criminals, criminals fight hard. They fight very differently, and it's very expensive. Well, you got to look at is the corrupt that's going on with the NPA. They fight very hard. So you get the really, the ones where the big money is, they're the most difficult, actually. And that's where some of the battles are going on. And that's where efforts have to be made. But at least they're making good progress. And at some point, someone's going to realize that putting your Lamborghini on Instagram is not really a good idea. Yes, that's right. I think that's I think those are those are some easy wins for people. And to some extent, going after corruption in that way is going after the easy wins. So what you try to do if you're a revenue authority is you try to get a bunch of high profile cases and then people, the other people who are not so good at this, they start to come forward. But then there's still the effort where you find the hardcore corrupt. Those people fight you tooth and nail. You can see them, but then getting them to court and getting them prosecuted, that's a very hard job. And They are picking off some, but it's going to be a long battle in that regard. Um, I suppose the cigarette industry, the illicit tobacco economy, I should say, is a a good example of that. These are people who are making a lot of money. They're doing it illegally. They're going to be very tough nuts to crack. They are a tough nut to crack. Look, SARS made some wins this year. So that was very good. But they need to make a lot more according to the number of reports that have come out. So it's so big, you know, getting one or two of these guys is not enough. You're really going to have to push harder and, and, and put more resources in. But those people are going to fight very, very hard. And it's, it's going to be a long battle. The commissioner says he's worried about the VAT refund system. He says there's scope for abuse there. How worried do we need to be about that? I mean, can we really change that system? Well, I think it's, you know, not new. They've always been worried about the VAT refund system. And that's why we've had the problem. The problem is, on the one hand, you know, the old system was just stop everybody's refund. That's really what went on. And again, during the Magnani era, they took it to new heights, despite what they say contrary. Um, But that refunds is very dangerous. And you get people who are criminals in the system generating false invoices and all of that. And that suddenly can be a big leak on the system very quickly. So suddenly you you, you can lose a few million here, a few million there. And, you know, then they they move very, very quickly. So the problem is it slows down the, the refunds for the honest. But that problem also exists in Europe. Now, how to get a hold of that? Somehow, 
we have not been able to find the right formula. So you see he's making good progress, but getting the right formula remains elusive. And I'm not sure why we're not able to get the right formula to shut this down. Um, there are different battles that are going on, but it's, oh, it's nothing new. But it's it's a it's, it's a real problem on the system because it slows down the innocent and you still hate to lose money quickly. Problem. I made the point earlier in in, in conversation with uh, Tabiso from Polakwani about how SARS is a good example that institutions can be reformed, and I think. SARS is easy to assess because it's based on numbers and we can see that the amount of money that's coming through and the rate of compliance is better than it was before. So so it's easy to assess. Is it easier, this is a very strange question, is it easier to reform a tax authority than, say, a prosecutorial authority because of the nature of it? In other words, because there are numbers and bank accounts, and and I know it wasn't easy, but is it perhaps easier to reform SARS than it is other institutions or not really? No, I, I would. It's a nice, it's an interesting argument, but no. At the end of the day, if you've got good leadership and you've got a good core team, you can do a lot. And you see this actually with crime in the United States. They did major reform on crime, and crime dropped heavily in the 80s and 90s. And then suddenly they undermined their own system and crime came back. There's a lot to be said for good leadership and good operational systems. And that's about having skill and having the right set of leadership skills, the soft skill and the hard skill. And unfortunately, there's nothing unique about the revenue service. So they can't say, oh, it's easier there. It's certainly not. Professor Keith Engel, really appreciate the time. Thank you. CEO at the South African Institute of Taxation. You with SAFM, 27 minutes after 7. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Mama Lodi, sundowns, a bit late for them. <laughs> yes, sundowns doing sundowns things. Um, at this point, I don't know. They just left it la- late last night, beating a very stubborn Richards Bay 1 0. And that was in their clash at Loftus last night. It was a last gas win secured through a deadly header by Junior Mendieta in optional time, given the Brazilians they are firmly entrenching themselves at the top of the standings with 49 points from 19 games. Downs remain well on course to lift their seventh league title in succession. Now they lead the second place Stellenbosch FC who beat Kaiser Chiefs 1-0 at FNB Stadium and have played Two games more by a considerable 11 points. In Polokwane at the Peter Mokaba Stadium, Sekakuna United and Cape Town City battled to a two-all draw. And Amazulu and Polokwane City shared the spoils in Durban, 0-0. And rugby, the Springbok women's sevens team ready to make waves in the iconic Hong Kong tournament with a blend of experience and fresh talent. They're not just there to participate, they're aiming for the top eight. Eloise Webb, a seasoned player, brings lessons from from their last Hong Kong heartache, turning past losses into current drive. And they focus solely on their opening match against Ireland on Friday starting at 6 a.m. It definitely gives us some confidence just to know that we, we can compete against the world's top teams. And I think we always take something out of each game, even if the win doesn't come our way. Uh, there's always something positive and work on as well. But uh, yeah, we're very excited for the island game. We're definitely giving ourselves a chance and we know what we're going to focus on. And I think we take it game for game. More rugby, the Blitzbok playmaker Devald Human is back from injury, ready to make and help the Springbok Sevens fortunes in Hong Kong. He's been described the tournament as a special place where all the teams would like to stand on the top spet step off the podium, something that has eluded the South Africans since they first played in the Far East in the late 1990s. And Hong Kong is quite special because I, this is where Sevens has started and, and, and everybody wants to play here and, and, and win a, a medal. So I, I think to be sure we haven't won a, a gold medal here yet, so we, we can see what we can do this weekend. Cricket and Mayank Yadev, the new pace sensation, has bowled the fastest ball this IPL season, reaching a speed of 156.7 kilometres an hour as the Lucknow Super Giants scorched past the Royal Challengers Bengaluru with a 28-run win. South Africa's Quinton de Kock's rapid 81 set the stage before Yadav's fiery spell decimated Bengaluru's batting lineup, even sending stars like Glenn Maxwell back to the pavilion for a duck. And with this 
Lucknow claim their second successive victory in a season. More sport on Sunrise, top of the hour. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. We'll be talking about farming in the next half hour. You with SFM leading the conversation. No load shedding at 730 Thank you, Stephen. In your headlines, KwaZulu-Natal police have confirmed gunning down nine suspects who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. They were killed in a gun battle with police in Marion Hill in Deben in the early hours of this morning. Legal analyst Benedict Piri says the Speaker of the National Assembly, Nosif Vyoma Pisangakula, should stop what he terms delaying tactics and hand herself over to the police. Last week, Mapisangakula launched an application in the High Court in Pretoria to effectively prevent police from arresting her. And the Electoral Court has until the 9th of this month to determine the appeal of the Umkoto Wesizwe Party's challenge of the IEC's disqualification of former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate in the May 29 election. Last week, the Commission upheld a member of the public's objection against Zuma, who served part of his 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. I'll have details on these and other stories at 8. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Let's kick it off in the capital, uh, Pretoria, with big uh, traffic on the N4 onto Pretoria Street. It's a really heavy queue from Rousseau Street on the N4 highway through Vartamea, through the M1, onto Pretoria, and down towards sort of the uh, Hatfield area. If you're on your way into central Pretoria, uh, that it's a big queue. There's also some lights out, park and lades in Arcadia, causing some congestion. Uh, the R21 towards the airport, two queues to work through this morning. The road works at Clayville, and then a crash uh, just around the sort of Atlas Road exit. So both of those with some quite heavy queues. And then if you're going northbound, there's been a collision before Oliphant's Fontaine Road and uh, the road works to Sinkhole after Oliphant. So uh, two queues working that way as well. A uh, collision on the N3 at Baclou, heading northbound. Traffic very heavy from the Alexandra area. Going to line up in some very heavy uh, traffic up through Limbro Park. Park this morning and traffic lights out all over Winnie Mandela Drive at Monte Casino at the N1 Highway south of the N1 at Sloan Street. So Winnie Mandela leaving four ways is horribly gridlocked and if you're coming off the highway you've got no chance of a free flow into uh, Winnie Mandela. So the N1 south from Ravonia north from Ramberg, uh, very heavy uh, backlogging going on there. At Durban if you're driving in from the airport side, a breakdown before you get to the Mschlunga exit, so quite heavy from Subaya. Uh, the M7 into St John's Avenue Bridge, that's a heavy one this morning. If you're going from North D from Queens, you'll get to Hans Detman and then you'll sit all the way into the uh, central Pine Town area. Uh, Cape Town, yeah, back to school. You can see the, the volumes right across uh, the city of Cape Town. Routes like Bossman's Dumb Road from Edgemead across the Montague Gardens, very heavy. Uh, Marine Drive queuing where it hasn't for over a week now uh, from Tableview through Sunset Beach. And there's been a crash on Marine Drive inbound at Pardon Island Road. That's just before you get to the N1. So that's a big queue arriving into Pardon Island coming through from Milnerton. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The Business Update on SAFM. With Jimmy Moyaha this week, presenter of the Business Show here on SAFM. Jimmy, good morning. How are the markets looking this morning? Morning, Stephen. Markets are in the red, tracking a couple of things from the U.S. side of it. uh, U.S. markets closed in the red overnight with uh, the Dow and the Nasdaq down by a percent and the S&P down about three quarters of a percent. So we anticipated that Asian markets would also follow suit and uh, Tokyo's down about uh, 0.8%, Hong Kong down 0.9%, South Korea down 1.3%, the Philippines down almost a percent there as well. Mainland China sitting flat at the moment uh, with Indian markets also uh, down at the moment. Uh, what, also, what is also playing out in the market is uh, some concerns around uh, the general sentiment where it relates to interest rates, uh, but also in Taiwan, we've come to know that there has been a 7.5 magnitude earthquake that has rocked uh, the Taiwanese island. And so as a result of that, markets in Asia are particularly sensitive uh, this morning, trying to navigate and make sense of what uh, that means for risk. In terms of risk sentiment, uh, that's filtering through to the gold price with gold futures crossing the $2,300 level there, but uh, the cash price sitting at $2,284 an ounce there. Uh, copper prices are up in the green as well, up almost three, uh, three quarters of a percent. Platinum up half a percent. Silver up two percent at the moment. And Brent crude also sitting at around $89 a barrel uh, at the moment. So not looking good for uh, equity markets, but commodities are seeing some uh, windfall as a result of this. If we look at some currency movements, the Rand 1878 against the dollar, 2324 against the euro, 2363 against the pound. And we're seeing 
that the Japanese yen is clawing back some gains against uh, both the euro and the dollar. Some car- uh, cryptocurrency movements, Bitcoin bounced off that $65,000 support level, sitting at $66,000 at the moment, but still down about a percent, with Ethereum around the $3,300 level. If anyone's watching uh, Solana, that's up uh, around almost 2% at around $188 there. And then all eyes on Jerome Powell, of course. Yes, as always, uh, every time the Fed chair takes the stage or takes to the podium, we do need to pay attention. He'll be speaking later today. We know that we've got... uh private jobs numbers, ADP jobs numbers out today as well. We've got non-farms uh, out on a Friday as well. So anything that Jerome Powell will say tonight will be uh, quite important in terms of the guidance that we're seeing. There's early rumors at this stage that w- while we had initially priced in three interest rate cuts before the end of the year, there's a huge fear or a growing fear at this stage that we might be expecting more than three, and that could send the markets uh, into a bit of a confusion uh, given that the initial ex- expectation was to get them by now. Uh, We've now pushed them back to after the middle of the year. And now all eyes, as you said, are on Jerome Powell to see how the U.S. Fed is reading the inflationary situation and what their outlook uh, seems to be from that perspective. While we are looking at U.S. matters, we know that U.S. President Joe Biden has reached out and had a conversation with uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping as well around improving relationships there. So uh, a very different approach to his predecessor, who went all out on a trade war with China. So we'll see how that unfolds and how that affects markets, particularly in an election year this year. And then you've got the Financial Standards and Conduct Authority later. Yes, uh, we speak to the FSCA on a regular basis. We try to make this an informative segment for our listeners. Uh, We're speaking to them today around their warning Wednesdays and some of the enforcement matters that they have been pursuing of late. We know that uh, the last time I spoke to them, they gave us an announcement around that Steinhoff uh, Mm. matter that they were dealing with, as well as the uh, the penalty that they imposed on the late Marcus Euster. So we speak to them on a regular basis around what the FSCA is busy doing as well as uh, how to keep consumers informed to avoid uh, dealing with unscrupulous providers wherever possible. Jimmy Moyaha, thank you. Host of the business show, you'll hear him later on SAFM. 23 minutes now to 8. Call us on 86 Let's go to Nkunzi on the line from Peter Maritzburg. Uh, this is a member of MK Visfin Reddy, accused of inciting violence. Nkunzi, hi, good morning. Morning, morning, Steve. You know, um, I was hoping that you were going to ask Mr. Mgombe as to give us examples as to where, 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 where did you see these inconsistencies that he's talking about, it's particularly with the, the courts. Because, I mean, people have a tendency of us taking the courts when they're doing their job. Mm. So, Well, I, I think that... that... I think the question has been that they haven't really gone to court. There haven't been charges in court that I, I remember. There's nothing, nothing of that sort. Mm. There's never been a political party speaking, at least as far as I remember, or as I, I mm. can recall, where a, a political party has blatantly stated in the public that there will be chaos and there will be bloodshed yep. if, they, point. if, if the, the, the elections or mm. if they lose elections or mm. if any court decision doesn't go their way, mm. like the MK has done. So Mr. Mkomezul is like sympathizing with oh, his. He's on, he's on the fence, as we always do. You know, he's sympathizing with all this language. There's mm. no but, there's no however. It's just purely wrong for any leader, only political party leader, to come on air, to come on public and, and incite violence. Mm. There's no justification whatsoever for that. But Mr. Yeah. Mbomezul is just saying, no, but no, there's an other side of it. Which is the other side? Where, 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 where have we seen this before? Yeah. He's not giving any examples that the, the court or the, the parliament is inconsistent. Okay. He's just sympathizing with this uh, horrible, horrible, horrible little old stuff inciting violence. All right. You cannot allow that, you know. All right. No, Nkunzi, I hear you. I think I hear the point that you're making. Thank you from Peter Maritzburg. Churchill in the Eastern Cape. Hi. My name's Stephen. Yeah, Stephen, I, I, I'm, I've also been listening to your case there. <clears throat> and uh, I'll partly agree with him. But I, I think one other thing that we should not lose sight of is the when a ruling party is factionalized for mm. this cause I want to refer to what happened in Gosin Natal. Yeah. They will never be able to deal with violence. We saw what happened there. Because sometimes you find that 
those who are supposed to enforce the law, they take orders from some and don't take orders from some. Yeah. Now, that is the case that we're experiencing here. Because if the ruling party was united, when it's elected to say it's leading all South Africans, instead of being mm. sexualized deeply, that's a, that's a problem that we're experiencing here. You will see, for instance, I want to cite also the case of uh, Mapisa Nagona. Once the courts rule against them, they identify themselves with certain factions. Mm. And that leading to you know, you know, you know, a collapse of the state. This is what we think happening. And I don't condone violence. Yeah. But you'll see, once people still see that you know, the criminal justice system or those that are supposed to enforce the law are overwhelmed for some reason or another, they're not doing their, their, I mean, their job. People are going to take advantage of the situation. Yeah. This is what is happening here. I don't condone violence, but you'll see this is what is happening. Because they can see what is happening in the ruling party. Yeah. No, absolutely. It is, as I asked, you know, do people do it because they know they can get away with it? Because they can. I mean, that's what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And you'll find that in the ruling party, there are those that are going, they're going to defend theirs, even mm. if they've done something wrong. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You'll see now there's going to be a motion of no confidence. We don't know what is going to happen. It has been happening previously with Jacob Zuma. You understand what I'm trying mm. to say? Instead of allowing people to deal with their cases in court, you understand me? Yeah. All right, Churchill in the Eastern Cape, thank you. Uh, Tommy in Greytown. Hi, Tommy. Also, this been ready. Yo, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Stephen. I would like to also to comment about some of the remarks made by the mm. Mr. Mgomezulu in relation to the remarks made by the person who was dragged in court and commended by the NPA uh, being commended by Kosatu. I want to agree with the Kosatu. You know, there's something called tragedy of the com- of the common. You know, can you imagine Stephen mm. living in a, in a, in a in flats where different flats about 20 uh, flats with uh, uh, with uh, with one electricity meter yeah you know when you when you behave yourself correctly you train mm. yourself it doesn't matter when other people are not doing it yes so here the people are advancing are taking action that is going to advance their benefit but the suffering will be the collective property mm. of everybody, even mm. those who are doing very well. For instance, this, you can't say we are going to reject the outcome if they don't give us what we want, because the outcome is a product of the process. Yeah, You can't say the outcome is wrong when you have not said anything about the process. And again, in terms of the law, the rule of law, we have said, we, are, we, we all submit to the law. The law does provide that if you feel that there is something that is wrong in the process, in terms of the road players, there are avenues that are provided in law that you have to uh, approach as things are happening in the process mm. to challenge them. The mm. IEC is independent. Mr. Mbomo is saying, well, uh, the issue of consistency is the parliament and court, but the parliament are not running elections. Yeah. It's IEC that is running elections. I think it was the independent. Yeah, it was the N- the court they are also independent. Sure, it's the NBA that I think had to make this decision to charge this Van Reddy, not it not the electoral to commission. To charge is something yeah. else. Whether you are wrong or right, yeah. it will be de- it will be determined by the court. Yeah. All right. So to then say uh, inconsistencies uh, and then and then recite mm-hmm. court and 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 and. and and Parliament, they are not mm. running the elections. I think this is being disingenuous. All right. Tommy, on the line from Greytown, thank you. Interesting. Professor Kumazulu, of course, has uh, interesting views on this. He's been studying this problem uh, for a long time. 16 minutes now to 8. Stephen Kruetis on SAFM. Well, there's been a letter which has been written to the president by the founder and CEO of the organization Hemp for Life, Ben Sussman. And he seems to be making the point, if I've understood him correctly, that one of the reasons he believes he and some of his colleagues are not receiving proper funding is because of the ethnic group that they are from. In other words, that they are because it's because they're coloured, to put it in simple terms. Let's hear from the man himself and make sure I haven't misrepresented him. Uh, ben Sussman is the founder and CEO at Hemp for Life. Ben, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation and the opportunity to chat to you. Sure, Thanks. in your words, what are you frustrated about? Uh, have I put it accurately? Yes, you have. Um, look, I, I, I need to add that I am 57 years old, so uh, I've, I've been around for a while. 
And, you know, we have a, in the 1980s, when, when I was starting high school, um, I started understanding politics and um, being colored. We've always been the race that's been stuck in the middle. And in, in the new South Africa, you know, um, the race roles have been reversed. But yet the coloreds, we are still stuck in the middle. And there, there are many op or many situations where the colored community is, is being discriminated against. Uh, if you look at the job sector, um, you know, government has gazetted into law mm -hmm. that uh, coloreds and Indians are, are not allowed to be employed in certain companies in certain provinces. It's been gazetted into law that this is uh, now become illegal. Um, you know, if you look at our infrastructure in the, the colored communities, there's no new developments. Our, our parks, our recreational facilities have deteriorated since the 70s uh, when it was built. Uh, there's no new developments, no new malls or, or business parks in, in colored communities in, in the Cape Flats, for example. Uh, but mainly for me, uh, it comes, it boils down to the small business funding opportunities for colored entrepreneurs. Now, the the colored community, uh, we are 5.6 million people in South Africa. Uh, we make up uh, 5.6 million South Africans. And if you just logically look at uh, any funding institution, if they get 100 applications for or with business plans for to fund their projects, 10% uh, will be successful. That is just the general cons mm -hmm. consensus across the board, uh, all all different uh, funding institutions. So if you logically look at a, a sector like the cannabis and hemp sector, if we are 5.6 million people, which is 10% of the population, at least uh, 10 of us should be funded by now. And that has not happened. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Okay, so Ben, I hear you and I, I remember the gazetting arguments around those regulations. I don't think they were quite uh, as stark as you suggest, but I realize that, that, that for you, uh, the feeling of it may be, may be the same. So I don't want to discount what you're feeling. Um, why do you think this has happened? And I mean, in government, I mean, it's interesting because, because our society has changed in interesting ways. Um, and I wonder, and I remember so clearly, I think it was Ibrahim Rasul um, came on the radio uh, 2018, 2019. He said to us that for him, um, social, the, the social cohesion had just gone backwards in the previous decade. Um, and I think that might still be the case. And he spoke particularly around the fact that uh, minority groups, colored Indian white people, were no longer represented in the ANC leadership, uh, largely, for example. Um, is that part of the problem, do you think, that the people who make decisions aren't sort of representative of the entire country, maybe? Yeah, look, Stephen, there's, there's a lot of anger coming from government towards colored people. Um, uh, you, you have to go back a bit, um, like I mentioned in my letter. You know, when, when apartheid was tabled in, in 1948, uh, there were no colored politicians uh, sitting around the table making or helping with that decision. Uh, that was made by the National Party and... Uh, it excluded anyone else from as part of that decision. Um, so there's a lot of hatred and anger towards colored people because of the way, you know, apartheid, as, as bad as it was, they were successful in doing one thing, and that was creating um, hatred amongst the different race yeah. groups. They divided, they divided everybody. Exactly. Everyone was divided, and that was the success of apartheid. If you if you look at the, uh, the the communities in Cape Town around Table Mountain, you've got Musenberg, mm. uh, Constantia, you've got uh, CBD, Sea Point, uh, Camps Bay, and so forth. So those were all the white neighborhoods. And then around that, you had your your Lavender mm. Hill, Ste uh, Steenberg, where I grew up, uh, a Retreat, uh, uh, what's it, Manberg, Bonte, of Athlone. So all the colored areas were then put next to the white neighborhoods. And then on the other side of the colored neighborhoods, you had the Kaya Licha, Nyanga, Guguletu, mm. and so forth, all the black uh, communities. Mm. So they were successful in creating uh, those designs so that if there was any physical uprising mm. from, from the black communities, they would take the anger out on the colored people first. 
because the the, the apartheid sure. government gave the, the white communities everything. They gave the coloreds a little bit less, and they gave the black communities absolutely nothing. You know, if if you look at the same structure in 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 Johannesburg or Gauteng, you, you know the the white communities are set up from Santon to uh, Ravonia mm-hmm. and so forth, and then you've got your Monde, your yeah. El Dorado Park, all your coloured communities, and then you've got Alex and mm. and so forth. Uh, so, you know, b- because of those structures, it has had a ripple effect over the the uh, the years, and that anger is still in government today, and that is why coloured people are excluded as much as white people are being excluded from from the jobs and from the funding and so forth. And I think that is where it stems from. Ben, um, yeah, no, I hear you, Ben. I mean, it's it's interesting, and I think I think in a way you may spark a bit of a debate here, and it's a conversation that we have heard before. Ben Sussman, thank you, and uh, he is the founder and CEO at Hemp for Life. Uh, your view on that? Um, do you agree with him? Uh, do you think that um, people are being deliberately excluded? Do you think that uh, people are complaining too much? Zero eight six triple zero two zero three two. Where do you stand on that? Nine minutes to eight. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. But coming in the Pretoria this morning, there's a lot to work through. A big crash scene uh, between Rigel Avenue and the R21. That's on the N1 South, and that's pushing traffic all the way back through to Linwood Road. That's super heavy. Uh, further down, the crash near Samrand Road on the N1. All lanes are open there. The vehicle's on the shoulder, but it's still heavy from as far back as Brockfontein Interchange. Once you get past that crash, you just stay in traffic all the way down to New Road. Also, the R21 with two queues this morning. The roadworks at Clayville backlogging you and then a secondary uh, delay as you approach the airport into a crash scene just by the four trekker road off ramp uh, the n1 towards winnie mandela very heavy lights are out all over winnie mandela including the n1 and including sloan street so the n1 south from ravonia north from bayers nordia uh, very heavy particularly those left lanes trying to off ramp into that congestion uh, that is the winnie mandela bridge system uh, protesting again just north of durban dumasani mkaya uh, road looks like it's closed between inunda and queen nandi so there's a lot of traffic backlogging in that area it's day two are protesting on that section of uh, road. And, of course, that's a key route between Kormashu and uh, New Germany, Pinetown area. Still with the breakdown before Gateway, the N2 South, heavy queues uh, all the way back uh, through to Sabaya. That's a construction zone, of course, as well. And then Cape Town, the N1 inbound, slow from Platycliff Hill to Cooper, get a change. Marine Drive stays heavy out of table view through Sunset Beach towards Racecourse Road. And then you pick up another queue through Pardon Island into a crash on Marine Drive uh, just by Pardon Island Road. Also very heavy on the Young Smuts Drive this morning. Uh, from Athlone going through to Clipfontaine Road and from Clipfontaine, or from the N2 uh, going along Young Smuts towards Clipfontaine Road. And Clipfontaine Road from Athlone all the way across to Mowbray down to Lisbeth Parkway is back to queuing up again. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Unforgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching and end the day with sundowners Nishisanyama. KwaZulu Natal is a jaw waiting to happen. Zakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining, and mountain biking adventures. Waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagala. Brought to you by Tourism KwaZulu Natal. Aston Villa have found comfort on the top half and they want maximum points to retain their decent position. And this time, Daniolo is around. The equaliser belongs to Aston Villa. Yet the bees want to cause havoc and deprive the villains by registering an away victory. We saw tried one of them in the first half. He's finished it in the second and Brentford have turned this round. This is the Premier League. Catch the exciting clash between Aston Villa FC and Brentford FC on Saturday, 6 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the Call us on 086-000-2032. Well, you heard the view there from Ben Sussman. Uh, Lee and Sakilelo, Voyo, Matthew, I see you. Let's start with Lee on the line from Cape Town. Lee, hi. Uh, do you agree with Ben Sussman? He says coloured people are being discriminated against. Yeah, you know, uh, Stephen, um, as a black person in Cape Town, that is such a sad thing to hear because the reality 
is so different. The reality is so painful when I think about it. In the Western Cape, colored people are so considered by institutions of employment, right, by organizations, in contrast to black people. And to say that is not to say that what he is saying is completely inaccurate. Mm. The reality is that both sides are being oppressed just Mm. as it was done Mm. then. Mm. It is still being done right now. Mm. At the moment, colored people enjoy more employment in the Western Cape than black people Mm. do. And when companies um, justify that, they will say it's because of of, of of the racial demographics that are here, which is, it's a true thing. But in doing that, black people are almost mm. completely excluded from the employment mm. sector. White people are overrepresented, mm. which is funny because if you consider the demographics, it is all you're always talking about a, 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 a them being more of a minority. Mm. Anyway. But in most cases, they are overrepresented by up to 90% mm. in companies. Then comes colored males, colored women. Mm. At the bottom of all of this is the black woman, right? Mm. At the bottom of all of this are are black people. And what bothers me about the situation is that in the Western Cape, the middle part, which is the colored people and the black people, fight each other. Mm. And more than they fight the fact that everyone is fighting, you're not employing me or I'm not getting opportunities because of you and so forth and so on. But then we, do, we don't look at the 90% sure. that is overrepresented. And the reality, another thing about it is that there is a lot of hostility towards black people in the Western mm. Cape. The, there is this idea that black people don't belong in the Western yeah. Cape. And that is also part and parcel of, um, of the rhetoric by yeah. the DA in that black people either are foreigners mm. or immigrants or from the Eastern Cape and they need to go back or something like that. And, and yeah, it's, it's Lee, it's, it sounds to me that you're, you're almost trying not to explode. You're so angry. <laughs> I hope I'm not misunderstanding you, but I can, I can hear your um, frustration. I mean, it's a very, you, you feel so frustrated, I think. It is. It, it, it's so frustrating because when you hear mm. how the people speak like this, it's almost, and, 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 and in speaking, he says that black people were kept in the mm. outskirts, given nothing, right? And then when it's time to balance all of that, still black people mm. are not being balanced into this equation. Mm. And when they, there's little, very little effort to mm. do that, you're still hearing these complaints, mm. um, you, you, you understand, and sure. you're still hearing people say that you don't belong, go back to the Eastern mm. Cape, um, you're taking opportunities mm. away from us. It is so painful because South Africa in the Western Cape does not belong to all mm. who live in it. Lee in Cape Town, thank you. And thank you for your considered anger, I think, on the subject. Nonsika Lelo on the line from Peter Maritzburg. How do you feel? Um, I am actually quite mixed about this. However, I, I don't feel like anyone is being unreasonable in their cries. Mm. However, I do feel um, that it's probably the frustration that makes you feel like um, the grass is green on the other side, mm. um, but it really isn't. Um, black people remain the highest with the highest unemployment rate. Um, we 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 remain the lowest in everything. Yeah. Um, and it would it really would be unfair to say that um, they the, 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 they're more considered mm. than the the, 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 the coloured people. Mm. I do, however, come from a coloured family myself, um, and I do feel that sometimes um, we some we 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 want people to work for us. When it comes, someone mentioned um, that even with activism um, or leadership in the ANC or, or, mm. or government, but I hardly see comrades of minorities being active in, 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 mm. in politics. 
every day um, in the day-to-day uh, projects or programs of the ANC, per se, because I'm an ANC member. And those that are active whenever they get space are always um, accommodated, embraced, and given space to lead, um, which is also sometimes unfair because I feel like they end up being considered just because of... Um, race yeah. or representation um, rather than activism. And those that are really much more active don't get space because sure. now, they, you know. So I, I feel like nobody is being unreasonable in this case, and I understand everyone's frustration. However, as long as black people are still in the mm. lowest of the low then they probably still do need that consideration. And I feel like if we are South Africans first and humans first before we are politicians and everything else, then maybe we will consider that the next person does need mm. to, 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 to live a life that is... Um, a full life, yeah. More dignified, yeah. yeah. Non Sikalelo, thank you on the line from Peter Maritzburg. More calls coming through on this voyage. So in Park Town, we'll try and get to you with SFM 8 o'clock. Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, uh, KZN police confirm gunning down nine suspects and all eyes on the electoral court to settle the Zuma candidature saga. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luanda Maume. KwaZulu Natal police have confirmed gunning down nine suspects who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. They were killed in a gun battle with police in Marion Hill in Durban in the early hours of this morning. Police are looking for two more suspects. Provincial Police spokesperson Robert Nechiwunda. The suspects were also sought in connection with a case of rape where they allegedly gang raped a girl and made a mother to watch the ordeal during a house robbery. They were also on police radar for serious and violent crimes in the area. When police caught up with them, intelligence had uncovered that the suspects were plotting to execute a hit on someone. Three firearms have so far been found in possession of the suspects and a search is still ongoing. A main hunt for the two assassin suspects is underway. Legal analyst Benedict Piri says the Speaker of the National Assembly, Nosi Vyuma Pisangakula, should stop what he terms delaying tactics and hand herself to the police. Last week, Mapisangakula launched an application in the High Court in Pretoria to effectively prevent police from arresting her. Yesterday, the court dismissed without the application with costs. Mapisangakula is accused of co- corruption during her tenure as Defence Minister. Piri says handing herself to the police would be the sensible thing for Mapisangakula to do now that she has lost her court case. We know how difficult it is to appeal when you've been struck off the roll for a lack of urgency. I I don't think that is a viable alternative for her Um, and the only sensible thing for her to do and probably the only thing for her to do right now would be to make arrangements to actually get processed in a manner that would allow her the same courtesy that she would have been allowed where she wouldn't be detained for very long and she'd be in court simply for the bail application that the the state would not oppose and thereafter the, the matter would be postponed and it would move on from there. In some election-related news now, the Electoral Court has until the 9th of this month to determine the appeal of the Umkondo Wesizwe Party's challenge of the IEC's disqualification of former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate in the May 29 elections. Last week, the Commission upheld a member of the public's objection against Zuma, who served part of his 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. MK Party spokesperson Ntlamulon Lela says they believe they have strong grounds on which to challenge the Commission's disqualification of Zuma. President Zuma uh, was not incarcerated off the back of what would be section 35 of the constitution where you ought to be before a judge and have a fair trial. Uh, President Zuma was incarcerated uh, by a constitution court uh, without having been afforded you know, uh, a constitu- his constitutional rights to a fair trial. So um, we cannot necessarily label it as a criminal case, you know, he all he did was contempt of what would be contempt of court. And that is not a criminal case. It's more so a civil matter. Um, and the IEC Act refers to a criminal matter. So there's a number of nuances that ought to be looked into here. 
The ANC's first Deputy Secretary General, Nomvula Mkonyane, says that the people of Soweto should vote for the ruling party in memory of the struggle stalwart Winnie Matigizela Mandela. Yesterday marked the sixth anniversary of Matigizela Mandela's death. Speaking at a commemoration in Soweto, Mkonyane said Mamwini was remembered for not turning her back on the ANC. The essence of Mama's uh, memory is that uh, in all its trials and tribulations, the ANC, you never walk away. You never turn your back against the NC. And it is only when there is a dire need for all of us to put on our boats, you would always see Umama. Even in her last uh, days, she walked side by side with President Cyril Ramaphosa here in Soweto, mobilizing people to vote for the African National Congress. That is all that we have to celebrate Mama through and ensure that we make sure that people of Soweto come out in their numbers. This following story contains graphic details which may upset sensitive listeners, including children. A pastor and his son will be back in the magistrate's Wittbeck Magistrates Court in Pumalanga on the 9th of this month. Pastor Solomon Mslanga in Enoch appeared in court yesterday on charges of attempted murder and kidnapping after they allegedly abducted a man and cut off his hands. Dumisani Mslangu had been accused of stealing at the pastor's church a week ago. Provincial police spokesperson Donald Mzuli. Yes, the two suspects appeared in court. One is age 55 and the other one 20. Uh, the two males uh, case was postponed to 9 um, April uh, for bail application. And this follows an incident whereby a 30-year-old man was um, chopped off his hands and a case of attempted murder has been opened. And yeah, we hope that uh, as they appear in court, the, the law will take its course. And finally, the newly inaugurated president of Senegal, Basiru Diomai Fai, has named the leader of the country's biggest opposition party as his prime minister. Usman Songo is Fai's left-wing political mentor. Songo had been in the opposition's presidential candidate until he was arrested and ruled ineligible to stand, sparking mass protests. Both men were imprisoned just before last month's elections. Recapping your top story, Kwazul Natal police have confirmed gunning down nine suspects who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. For SIFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 8.30. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sunrise Sports Headlines. Soccer, Kevin Johnson standing firm on his coaching role with Kaiser Chiefs amid challenges. And in rugby, the Stormers set for a gripping showdown against La Rochelle. Stay with us for the full details just before 8.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Yeah, 21 between Pretoria and the airport as you read under pressure. You've got the uh, roadworks airport bound at Clayville. That's a heavy backlog. And then an earlier crash down by a uh, four trekker road. It's still backlogging traffic uh, with queues pushing back towards uh, Pomona Road territory. And then if you're heading north, a fatal crash opposite Tembisa and the sinkhole uh, lane closures after the Oliphant's Fontaine exit. So two queues uh, both ways this morning. Big crash on the M1 south in Pretoria between the Rigel Avenue and the R21. Traffic coming out of Pretoria towards Joburg. Uh, backlogging as far as uh, Atterbury Road. Looking pretty heavy. Uh, delays both ways on the N1 to get off at Winnie Mandela Drive at four ways. Heavy from Ravonia. Heavy, very heavy coming up from Ramberg. Uh, no traffic lights at the uh, and one and also at the uh, William Mandela and Sloan Street Junction as well. Uh, just again, some protesting on Dumasani and Kaya. Uh, this is in the Sianda area of uh, Kormashu. So if you're moving between Kormashu and the uh, Quadebeka, New Germany area, you may be uh, diverted again. Day two of the protest there. And Cape Town's been a heavy uh, back to school uh, Wednesday today. The N1 stays uh, queuing from uh, Platacliff Hill all the way through to Cuba. Get a change. The M3 slow to UCT. And there's backlogging on the M5 from Rondebosch up towards Barclay Road in the Maitland area. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Nine after eight. Good morning. You're with SAFM, SAFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Crutus. Good to hear from you this morning. Well, conversations coming through this morning around, I suppose, um, the treatment, let me call it that, of uh, people who identify as coloured in our country. Lots of calls coming through around that. 086-000-2032. We'll talk about immigration and migration from 830. Is it true to say we're losing people? Are we gaining people? How is all of that working? That's what we'll be looking at uh, from 830. I think it's an important conversation. Nine after eight. 
Call us on 086-000-2032. Voya on the line from Park Town. You've been on hold for a long time. You heard uh, the conversation we had earlier. Good morning. Voya, are you with Hello. us? Hi, I'm in Europe. Oh, sorry, Voya. All right, go for it. Yes, I agree with that guy 110%, to be honest. That's why my president, I still got a green ID, uh, <laughs> John, but that's why my president, Katie McKenzie, mm-hmm. uh, for my party represented colors because no one really cared about them. Mm-hmm. No RDP houses, pro- projects for colors. And then sometimes I look at the police after they qualified at the training college, only see brown people. And I ask myself, what about mm-hmm. colors? What about Indians that are in this country? And they don't go in a training for police. Mm-hmm. And I agree with the guy 100% that are neglected. And right. they are part of us. This is wrong. All right, Voyo in Europe, thank you. Ronald in the Northern Cape. Hi, Ronald. Hi, good morning, Stephen, and good morning to the listeners. Uh, Stephen, I first want to say I'm I'm the chairperson of the Northern Cape Communities Movement. Yeah. uh, And we're one of the 56 on the ballot paper. But the point that I want to make with regards to colored and the Northern Cape specifically, the Northern Cape is a majority colored province. Yeah. It is more than 30% of the land. But there is only five seats from the Northern Cape that is in Parliament. When we address the issue of the land, the voice of the colored people is in the far majority. But the land issue, they are in the far majority when it comes to land. They own more land, but they have less of a voice when it comes to land. Which means when the land issue is going to be resolved, it's going to be the majority outside of the Northern Cape. They have less land than the people and the colored people specifically mm. of the Northern Cape, which means they then have to submit themselves in terms of land and the, the, the resolution to land based on the minority in terms of ownership of land. Now, this land in the Northern Cape, we were not there this place. It is our land from our ancestors. It is the land of the Koi and the sun from mm. which the colored people are coming. I'm raising this issue just to show how colored people are being oppressed, specifically when it comes to land and the ownership of land. Okay. That the majority of the land that they are owning in this country is going to be taken from them. If you look at the, even at the pattern of how land has been distributed in the Northern Cape, majority of the people who got land in the Northern Cape is not even from the Northern Cape. But it's because how the colored people's mm. voice has completely been mm. oppressed when it comes to issues where they should be having mm. the majority of the say. Because right. how do you take two provinces? If you take the Northern Cape and the Western Cape, where there are a lot of colored people, and you put the land together which they are owning in this country, you will find out that they actually have nothing to say about their own ancestral land. Sure. But, I mean, it's Ronald, that, that, that's all worked out by population. I mean, you know, you shouldn't have, uh, you know, you can't work it out by how big a province is or how much land there is. You've got to work it out by population. But at the end of the day, Stephen, the, the conversation that we are having is how colored people consistently have to be at the back because of their numbers, because mm-hmm. of how they are situated. If we look at colored people, uh, or, or even if we look at race, you will find that each ethnic group is situated in a particular piece of land. Mm-hmm. If you look at the Zulu people... Mm-hmm. That's the, very... The that's have, Unfortunately, have, have Ronald, that's... Uh, yeah, but Ronald, I mean... I don't know if we can live now like we lived in our history. I mean, I had this argument with someone the other day. We, we all move around. No, we can't, Stephen, but we can't <laughs> want to take ancestral land. Yeah. If you take away the Northern Cape from, from, from colored people, then what are you leaving them with? All right. What is going to happen? We will never be taking away the Zulu land because it's been placed into a trust because of the ethnicity. Mm. Okay. Colored people is not afforded that because constantly... They are being pushed around. They can't claim themselves to be Koi. They can't claim themselves to be San or Krikwa mm. or anything. All right, yeah. Ronald on the line from the Northern Cape. It's an interesting argument. Thank you. 14 after 8. Stephen Kruetis on SAFM. The organization, the government body foundation, the governing body foundation, it's a, it's a body that deals with schools, says it believes that not all of the groups involved in education have been properly consulted by the Basic Education Department on the issue of how teachers will deal with the issue of gender. A toolkit for teachers 
uh, who deal with early childhood development, so young children. The toolkit includes material about children who are trans or intersex. In other words, it talks about children who do not identify or are not girls and boys. Dr. Anthea, uh, Dr. Anthea Terresto is the National Chief Executive Officer at the Governing Body Foundation. Dr. Terresto, good morning. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Good morning. You don't seem to like this toolkit. Why not? The main objection to the toolkit, um, from our perspective as a representative organization of governing bodies which represent parents in schools and education, is that it's aimed at very young children. It's the naught to nine-year-old age group. And that it wasn't fully consulted to take into account the rights of parents to teach their children their cultural and, and religious beliefs in particular. And that this particular document has adopted an ideology um, regarding gender and sex that promotes the non-binary approach. So that already at a very early age, children are taught that um, male, female, or boy, girl is on a continuum. So you don't necessarily have to be a boy or a girl. You could be anywhere along the line between a girl and a boy. This is complex material, and it may be appropriate at a, an older age to get people thinking. But we believe that the ideology in the document is one-sided, and we would say as as the education department, they need to be, first of all, they need to consult and get the views of a very broad uh, range of uh, people in, whose children are at school, but then be equal in terms of um, the ideology promoted so that, yes, some people believe that uh, a girl and boy is strictly connected to the biological sex, and others believe that it may not be, that okay. someone Let could be in between. Okay. So, Dr. Torresto, I have it in front of me as it happens. Um, and it starts out talking about why gender matters. The slogan for it, by the way, is all are welcome. I'm sure you don't argue with that. Not at all. Okay. It then talks about girls. It talks about boys. It talks about um, some of the stereotypes around that. It does say that gender isn't an either-or scenario but a spectrum. And then much lower down after talking about boys and girls, it talks about transgender and what that means. Now, if a fact is a fact, what's wrong with teaching children facts? Some people are trans. Finish and clear. Isn't that true? That's, that's perfectly, perfectly correct. But what we believe is that the parents should have the right to teach their children of those early years what they actually believe. Much well, well, well hold on. Document. Facts, facts mm. are facts, are facts, right? Yes or no? Yes, yes. But what facts do you teach? Do you teach a child of naught to nine? There are some facts which are better taught at a more appropriate age. So, okay, you talk about religious and cultural beliefs. That's where you, you base this on, yes? Well, well no, I, I, we don't because we don't take a position on this. Our members are extremely diverse, and they would 100, some would 100% agree with, with all of this, but there are mm. some families who, for their own religious or cultural reasons, teach their children something else. Now they go to school and their teacher, who they regard as pretty important, um, tells them something mm. different. Now, okay. we don't necessarily believe that's in the best interest of a very young child. Later on, when children uh, start uh, arguing with their parents on beliefs, that is much more appropriate. But okay. a young child can't be at odds with the parents. Well, I don't know about that. So, for example, there will be children who are brought up in homes and they, these children will be taught that to hold uh, racist beliefs is, is normal, 
right? And we, will, we would ask, we would demand, we would believe, I think, that our Department of Basic Education has an obligation to make sure that children, even if they're exposed to that kind of prejudice and taught that that kind of prejudice is normal at a young age, we would expect the Basic Education Department to ensure that children realize that it is wrong, okay? And when people talk about religious and cultural beliefs, unfortunately, Dr. Terrestrial, this can also be used as a basis for prejudice, And isn't that the problem? People might say, I don't believe that people are trans. Well, I think they'll be wrong to say that. But I don't think that they can then demand that that schools teach uh, uh, things that are not a fact. And it is a fact. So therefore, schools should teach it. No, that is fine, but then one, but it's from pushing just the one belief that you say some people believe this and some people believe that. I agree with you with the. the well, race it's a bit issue. like it saying that some department. people can be racist and some people can't. I mean, no, it's got to go. No. One's got to. If, if it goes one way for race, it's got to go both ways. Um, yes, I think you've taken you've taken the extreme on this one. We're saying let's the, let the families talk about this, and we can say. We would teach, welcome all. I don't have a problem mm. with that. We don't have a problem with um, non, non-stereotypical non play. We, we want to teach that there are no defined mm. roles. There's lots in the document that is quite acceptable. But we just say that we need to say some people believe this and some people believe that. And you see, it's not like racism. Because it's, it's not wrong to believe that you're a girl because you've got... Um, female um, biological Uh, organs. And it's not wrong to believe that there is a spectrum. Neither view is wrong. Whereas racism, we have got to the point in saying the one view is wrong. And that's that's the fact. It's wrong, wrong. But on this case, both sides are welcome. And this, I think, is what we want to push. Groups like groups often will say this is for parents to discuss. Do you really think that parents will actually discuss it? And isn't this always the problem? Is that parents don't discuss it, and if they do, they may discuss it in a prejudicial way. And that's why uh, we actually, in in the end, it's better for society, for the basic education department to ask schools to discuss it, because we know parents don't. Yes, and and we don't have a problem. We don't have a problem with that. It's also uh, in this that if you're a teacher of this age group and it's made compulsory for you to teach a belief that is against your own religious belief, that could be problematic as well. Um, So there's just much more to be talked about before we put it out there. It's not an entirely wrong document. We need it a bit more balanced. We also need to get the motivation straight. When it says it's to reduce GBV and HIV transmission because of patriarchal beliefs, uh, subordination of women, and so that's that's what it says in the document. Yeah. We want research that actually says, well, how does it? Uh, what has been done to prove that teaching a five-year-old these particular um, concepts is actually going to stop GBV? We would say. Society, actually, the, the generation that is perpetuating it currently uh, are in charge of children for 84% of the time. They only go to school for 16% of their hours. So 84% is the community and the family. Yeah, That's but, where we've got to work on the gender the Sure, gender but why not ask violence. schools to do it too? I mean, I don't understand why schools would have to opt out of that. No, schools are not opting out. We opt out of the stereotypical role. We we promote um, equality for all. Mm. Uh, we promote the welcome all. We teach children uh, about diversity. Mm. We teach children that everybody must have dig- mm. dignity, no matter what um, gender or Whether sex they're a girl they or boy or like. trans. Yeah, that's right. We t- but that is perfectly fine as long as we take a totally balanced view on this matter. So all we are saying is let's go back. Talk a bit more and put out a document that actually accepts the fact that some people Mm. do have a a binary approach rather than Mm. the non-binary approach is the norm. Let's say it's both. It's welcome. You're basically saying that we're going to exclude or ignore the identity of a group of people. I don't know if we can make that argument. No, no, we're saying we, we, ident- we, we recognize non-binary approach. That is what some mm. people hold. 
and some other people hold a binary approach mm. based on their religion or culture or whatever, and they have a right to that under the Constitution. It's not like racism where we ha- where it's outlawed. I, I don't <laughs> it, know if everyone's it, going to see it like that, Dr. Toresto, because what well, you're saying is that this group of people who identify as trans must be ignored and children can't be taught that they exist. Not at all. Not at all. Well, how I'm else saying, can I understand what that. you're saying? No, what we're saying is that it needs to in- give equality to both viewpoints, that some people believe this and mm. some people believe that equal. Okay. It's, it's pushing equality, welcome all. And we have no problem with welcome all, but we have it. We think the document is just a little bit unbalanced and we need to just talk a little bit more to get it a balanced document. There's much in it that is perfectly correct. And you do have to teach children how to play in particular ways. And you do have to ad- address uh, questions about uh, sexuality, which the document also deals with towards the end. You do have to address it. And teachers do have to be okay. helped how to address it. But to be more balanced, accepting of both mm. views that some people believe this and some people believe that, and both are okay. Dr. Anthea Toresto, thank you. National Chief Executive Officer at the Governing Body Foundation. Jacob and Witbank Emelachleni, how do you see it, Jacob? Stephen, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the doctor, but however, I am 100% with the doctor. And I think, I don't know if you're just uh, doing a job by arguing <laughs> the doctor, mm. but I actually agree with, it, with her because I think, um, uh, like what she's saying, she's, she's, mm. she's not saying that... Um, uh, like we as parents need to be given the opportunity to to teach our our kids mm. a certain belief. Like Stephen, I don't believe that. I, I, well, I, you have babies. I have had you. So if your baby go to class at a very young age and they start telling them or teaching them about sexual mm. intercourse, that would have been uh, inappropriate. But yeah. at a certain age, they need to to be exposed to to that teaching. However, it's the same thing that the doctor, I, I, according to my okay. understanding, she said that. We need to be given the opportunity to teach our sons, our, our babies, yeah. that there is um, uh, uh, the difference between gender and um, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. We need to educate them and then based on our beliefs. So if my baby believes that he uh, is, a, is a monkey and then tomorrow uh, yeah. 100 kids at school believe that mm-hmm. they are monkeys, if there is some scientific proof that, yes, they are behaving like monkeys at certain points, mm-hmm. and it is also based in, in, in belief. I don't believe that now my, 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 the other, your kids should be taught that, yes, mm. the, he is a monkey and by force. So I believe that we need to be given an opportunity as parents to educate our, our kids uh, according to our own beliefs. And uh, that's how it should go. Not to say okay. they are not existing or mm. what, but yeah, that's my point. Thank All you right. very much. Jacob on the line from Vitbank. Thank you. Uh, 27 minutes after 8. How dream is for the legends who make moves to save and pay from as little as 40 rand from Santon to Rhodesfield. It's for the bozzers who switch off the geezer when no one's home. And for our clever who get that there's food at home means exactly that. So when it comes to travel, make moves that save and pay from as little as 40 rand from Santon to Rhodesfield Station. How train for people on the move. Masanda wanna trust their creativity to ensure Yanga gets nothing from Zanzi's capital city. But the gentlemen from the east want to leave Gabuyelo in tears. This is the second leg quarterfinal battle of the CAF Champions League. Experience Africa's beautiful game, Mami Lodi Sundowns versus Young Africans, on Friday, 5 April at 8 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Attention filmmakers, are you ready? It's time to showcase the vibrant tapestry of KZN's cultural heritage at the Simon Mabunu Sabela KZN Film and Television Awards, South Africa's ultimate celebration of cinematic excellence. In partnership with the SABC and KZN EDTA, we champion innovation, paving the way for the future of cinema. This year we go beyond imagination. Cut, edit your one-minute submissions because a call for entries is now open until the 28th of March, 2024. For more information, visit www.kznfilm.co.za or follow us on our social platforms. Join the conversation using hashtag SSA24KZNFilm. Our kingdom is your stage.
This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. What's happening with the Chiefs? Ah, their embattled head coach, interim head coach, Kevin Johnson, still believing he's the right man for the job at the present moment. And the players have not given up on him yet. This following their 1-0 loss on uh, Stellenbosch FC last night, a DSTV Premiership match played at the FNB Stadium. This was Chiefs' fourth loss in 13 matches under Johnson as the club continues to slip down on the log standings. Elsewhere, Cristiano Ronaldo notched up his second hat-trick in the space of 72 hours as Al Nasser thrashed Pizzo Mosimani's ABBA team 8-0 in the Saudi Pro League. The five-time Ballon d'Or winner scored three goals and recorded two assists in the first half for the ninth time as uh, the Saudi Arabian champions are hoping to be, well, above uh, in this league. Elsewhere, Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola suggested his ego was responsible for a confrontation with Jack Grealish following Manchester City's goalless draw against Arsenal at the weekend. No, I'm the famous person of the team and I don't recognise and I need the cameras to my ego go to sleep with uh, incredible satisfaction. So that is the reason why. So... Always I try to criticize the players there and let them feel that how bad they are. And and especially when Erling scores three goals, the compliments has to be with me, not with them. That's why I use the cameras to, to do it there. So my advice next time, don't film us, it will not be a problem. And finally, Arsenal's defensive solidity in front and centre as Mikel Arteta hails the critical role of his backline in their Premier League title chase. With the fewest goals conceded for their defending, Arsenal maintained their 12th clean sheet in their 0-0 draw against Manchester City. Now they prepare to host Luton Town tonight at 8.30pm. Here's their boss, Mikel Arteta. Well, this is where we want to be and... Uh... And now we want to take this opportunity and, and make it happen. And uh, we worked um, every single day with, with that enthusiasm and, and passion to, to make it happen. And, um, and I'm enjoying the moment as well. I see the team really flowing and they are really excited about playing this game. And that's what, that what has to be drived um, now this, this journey to the end. I'll bring you more sport on SAFM around half past 12. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. Migration and immigration. That's next to you with SAFM, where all are welcome. It's 8.30. Thank you, Stephen. In your headlines, residents of Lehigh Phase 2 near Orange Farm in the south of Johannesburg say their children are unlikely to return to school as the second term of schooling gets underway countrywide this morning. This after the Red Ants demol- demolished multiple structures last week, leaving scores of residents, mostly women and children, homeless. KZN police have confirmed gunning down nine suspects who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. They were killed in a gun battle with police in Marion Hill in Deben in the early hours of this morning. And legal analyst Benedict Piri says the Speaker of the National Assembly, Nelson Vyoma Pesang Makula, should stop what he terms at delaying tactics and hand herself to the police. Last week, Mapisang Makula launched an application in the High Court in Pretoria to effectively prevent police from arresting her. I'll have details on these and other stories at 9. SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. You're heading out of Pretoria on your way to Joburg this morning. Uh, there's the collision scene between Rigel and the R21 and the traffic backlogging through to Gasfontein and looking particularly heavy. And then you come through Brockfontein, you get to Old Joburg Road and you slow right through to the uh, new road uh, exit. If you're on your way to the airport, just a reminder of roadworks at Clayville and then an earlier crash uh, down by Four Trekker Road. Uh, both of those um, incidents, if you like, have improving traffic rather than worsening, but it's a good idea just to give yourself extra time to get through. And then if you're on your way to Pretoria, a fatal crash opposite Tembisa, and then the sinkhole after the Clayville exit. So two queues working up to uh, uh, the Pretoria area. Uh, very heavy on the N1 towards the Woody Mandela exits. There's uh, four traffic lights out all over Woody Mandela at the N1 highway and at Sloan Street. So southbound from uh, Rivonia North from Randburg. It stays very heavy. There's also a crash uh, in that mix just going up to Bayers Nordir on the N1 northbound side as well. Uh, Durban still with a breakdown on the N2 south before Gateway. Traffic 
grey heavy from Subaya. And Cape Town, the N1 into town is busy and it's likely to be for some time. We're currently looking at queues from Plattercliffe Hill all the way through over the elevated freeway towards the foreshore. And we've just had another massive uh, cruise ship docking at Cape Town Harbour. That's going to put a lot of onlooking delays over the elevated freeway, but it'll put a lot of tourist traffic and recreational traffic uh, in the CBD and out towards the waterfront. So if you're heading into central Cape Town area today, give yourself time to get through an inevitable traffic backlog. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Unforgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching, and end the day with sundowners Nishisanyama. KwaZulu Natal is a joy waiting to happen. Ziakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining, and mountain biking adventures, waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagala. Brought to you by Tourism KwaZulu Natal. Aston Villa have found comfort on the top half and they want maximum points to retain their decent position. And put it back, and this time, Daniolo is around. The equaliser belongs to Aston Villa. Yet the bees want to cause havoc and deprive the villains by registering an away victory. Wissart tried one of them in the first half. He's finished it in the second and Brentford have turned this round. This is the Premier League. Catch the exciting clash between Aston Villa FC and Brentford FC on Saturday 6 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Mediated Conversation on SAFM. 25 minutes to 9 the time. Well, over the last few weeks, there's been a series of reports claiming that South Africans who've been living in other countries in places like Nigeria, Dubai and Europe have been coming home. Some estate agents, for example, have said that people are finding life too difficult in other countries and they've decided to come back. Unfortunately, the numbers seem to tell a different story. Instead, it looks like a one million people who are South African have left the country in the last 20 years or so. But measuring what people are doing is quite difficult. People can leave a country and literally leave everything behind, lose their South African citizenship and become a citizen or of another country. Or they can just move to a place for a while and keep their South African citizenship and keep their bank accounts here open, even keep their local cell phone numbers. So to try and track what people are doing is quite tricky. So then what is happening? Are we losing people or gaining people? And how does this fit into global patterns of migration? And what does the law say about South South Africans who are now living overseas and if they want to come back. Well, first this morning, Diego Itoralde is the Chief Director for Demographic and Population Studies at Statistics South Africa. We'll ask him about the numbers. Then, how do we fit into global patterns of migration? Professor Lauren Landau is a Professor of Migration and Development at the University of Oxford and a, prof- and a Research Professor at Wits University. And then the law, Gary Eisenberg is an Attorney and Director at Eisenberg & Associates. We start then with, from Statistics South Africa, Diego Toralde. Diego, good morning and thanks for your time. Diego, good morning. Are you with us? Uh, my mistake. Sorry about that. I have you in the wrong place. Diego, there you are. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me and good morning to the listeners. Okay. Firstly, how do you work out if people are leaving a country? I mean, how do you know what they're actually doing? Um, this, this part of the report that we've released, we actually are dependent on the censuses and other data collection points that are conducted by other countries who count South Africans. So as Statistics South Africa, we don't, we don't count people. We don't necessarily uh, look at people who are departing at, at Oatambo or other airports and ask them, where are you going and why are you going and are you coming back? Uh, so we, we actually depend on, on others. And the UN Population Division actually then um, compiles uh, by using all censuses around the world at a specific point in time, estimates of the number of people of one country who are living in any other country. So uh, that's the rationale behind how how we come up with the estimates of around 900,000 South Africans living elsewhere. So you reckon it's around 900,000 people who were born here, presumably grew up here, who are now living in other countries? That's correct, yeah. Can you tell if they're ever going to come back? I mean, you can't predict the future, I suppose. So do you presume now that they've left South Africa permanently? 
um, in when the, when we talk about the mobility of people, anything is possible. Um, so as much as we cannot predict, and, and as official statisticians, we don't we don't have a taste bud for what what is likely to happen in in, in future. Um, we we do make sure that the mechanisms are there in place to ensure that when people come back or even if more people leave, that we are able to measure that. Of course, we can look at various indicators out there, and we know that if 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 there is a war somewhere, that it's likely that South Africans in a, a country where there is a lot of generalised violence are are likely to either move elsewhere or or to consider coming home. Um, so uh, we, we we should be ready to consider either either approach of either people uh, coming home or or even that more people might be leaving. Do we know where people have actually gone to? Are there particular parts of the world that they seem to go to and particular parts of the world they don't go to? Yeah, so I, I think that the language that we speak, which is mostly English, is a, is a point of attraction. So we find about 250,000 of those 914,000 are in the United Kingdom. But there are also significant numbers in the United States and Canada, New Zealand and Australia, and I think a new destination being the United Arab Emirates. Um, so very much like when we talk about immigration and we, we say that most uh, most of the immigration is coming from the SADC region because of the proximity. I think in this case, the language and the opportunities that are afforded to South Africans in, in those other countries that I've mentioned are, are the reason why South Africans are moving there. Is there any evidence that you're aware of to show that people are coming back? Or does the evidence show that people are still leaving? Or is it too soon to say? Yeah, so I, I mean, I've, I've read the reports, uh, particularly from, from estate agents, etc., showing that, that um, since the end of COVID, many South Africans who have accumulated significant amounts of wealth are considering coming back and buying into high-end properties, especially in the Western Cape. Um, this, this is, however, a very uh, current development, and I think it will be some time until we actually see that in the data. So when we collect data on migration next, uh, we, will, we will hopefully see the, the existence of these, these uh, individuals who are returning. Diego Utorolda, thank you. The Chief Director for Demographic and Population Statistics at Statistics South Africa. You are this FM, 19 minutes now to 9 the time. Continuing your mediated conversation around migration and immigration, Professor Lauren Landau, Professor of Migration and Development at Oxford University and a research professor at Wits University. Professor Landau, good morning and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Good morning. When we see people leaving South Africa, is there any way of knowing why they are going or, to put it another way, whether people are f- leaving South Africa or whether they're being pulled to another country? Well, I think whenever you move, you're making decisions about where you are and the conditions there and what you hope the conditions will be uh, somewhere else. So when they're thinking of going to Australia, to, to uh, New Zealand, to the United States, Canada, etc., the expectation is either this will be better for me, either financially or in terms of security, in terms of lifestyle, or what I think we're seeing a lot of is this will be better for my children. If I can get citizenship, my, my children can go to university here or study here. And fear over fu- South Africa's future is part of what's behind uh, people making the moves at, at this point. Do we see a major difference between the migration patterns in South Africa and migration patterns in the rest of the world? I mean, people move around all the time and always have done. Is there anything particular that stands out for what we see here? Well, looking at the report that Diego was speaking about, I think that there's a few things. I mean, the first is to say people move when they can, and the people who have the more resources tend to move because it it costs a lot to resettle and and you often need those resources to be allowed in to a place like the United States or or Britain. And because of that, what we see is that South Africa's population, uh, the people who move, reflects a little bit the the stratifications that we see within South African society itself. So it is primarily uh, white people who are moving because they tend to be wealthier, they tend to be better educated, but we're increasingly seeing black uh, and Indian and and colored South Africans also moving as people move into the middle class and are able to afford those journeys. Um, 
are there sort of moments where you can see a, a migration from South Africa picks up and moments when it slows? I mean, does it happen around elections historically? Um, and people will talk about friends of theirs who left South Africa 50 years ago, you know. I mean, this has always been a thing in South African middle class society, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, people have left. If we go back, a lot of people left during uh, the violence of the 1980s or in protest of apartheid. And uh, we have seen, of course, a, a significant people number of people who left just after 1994 when they felt the country was was irredeemable. Um, some of those did come back, I think, and, and, you know, others have continued to leave. The data doesn't show us at a very specific time around a, an election, per se. Uh, clearly, there is a, a great deal of anxiety in South Africa now. The violence that happened a couple years ago, uh, the elections, the electricity, etc. But as as Diego has mentioned, we're not going to see these patterns until uh, the, those people are picked up somewhere else. So yes, people have always left. Uh, I, anecdotally, as I'm sure is the case for you, there's a lot of people talking about leaving uh, now, and uh, more than than a few years ago. But I don't know if they'll actually do it. Globally, are there changes to the patterns of migrations that, we, that, that we're seeing? As I made the point that migrations always happened, over the last few years, have we seen changes to sort of where people are moving to and where they're moving from? Well, I think there is a diversification of where they're moving from, for sure. Uh, as, as African countries, Ghana, um, South Africa, Ethiopia, become wealthier, people are able to move, they're able to get the skills that they need to be able to find jobs in, in, in the West, let's say. Um, as far as destinations, yes. I mean, England, these sort of wealthy European countries have been long the destinations for, for many people. But of course, most Africans, for example, when they move, they move within the continent. And so while there is this group of South Africans who've moved to Europe, there's many others who are also moving to, to Nigeria, to Kenya, and of course, uh, Africans moving into South Africa. So there's a, a, an enormous diversity. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is, is more sending areas and also countries like, like the UAE or, or elsewhere who are becoming increasingly receiving countries. Is it possible to know if around the world more people are moving than we've seen in the past? Let's try and put it in more scientific terms. If a <laughs> higher percentage of the world's population is mi migrating now than used to. Well, I think uh, that there is definitely more movement, but most of those are within people's countries. People going to cities, for example, coming to Gauteng, uh, looking for work. As a percentage of the global population, we're not that different from where we were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, what we see in the, in the last few years is a lot more people displaced than has, have, has happened for about 40 years, in part because of, of the war with Ukraine and other conflicts. But people are moving. Of course, we all move. Um, but that is that is uh, it seems to be part of, of the human experience. Um, I presume you talk about people who are forcibly displaced. I mean, you'll see something like uh, Ukraine, like the Middle East, um, in Gaza, people will be forcibly displaced there. So, I mean, I imagine migration tracks events, but it must also track uh, expectations. In other words, if people think this part of the world is going to get better, or this country is going to get better, or this country is going to get worse, then does migration track expectation in a strange way? And those expectations can be difficult to sort of manage. Yeah, it definitely, uh, it, it, there's often a lag, right? And that people, yes, there'll be the speculators, the one who goes to a place because they think that something's coming up. Most of us will look and watch and, and see what's happening and then make that decision to go. When it's a long journey, when you're changing continents or, or even parts of continents, it's not something people do overnight. So there tends to be quite a lot of, of deliberation. I think what we see in South Africa now is really a result less of what's happening in, in Europe or elsewhere and more speculation about what's happening in South Africa and whether things will improve, whether they're stabilized, whether things will get worse. And then people are making their decisions on, on almost entirely on that basis. Um, sometimes we see a place like, um, for, I understand the Netherlands has a bit of a skills shortage, so that's attracting people. Uh, several times you've mentioned, others have mentioned the United Arab Emirates, uh, particularly because they have jobs. So people, I presume, are following opportunity. I mean, that's really the story of migration, isn't it? Yeah, they will follow opportunities and they'll try to match what those jobs are with what they can do or what they would like to do. So if you want to come work in the National Health Service in the UK, obviously you have to have some sort of medical qualification or, or get one. Uh, going into the IT sector in Silicon Valley, I'm not going to get a job there if I show up. But someone who has a, a training in, in tech definitely would. 
So it depends where, and you start to see that sort of stratification with different kinds of people going to different areas. United Arab Emirates has a lot of, of jobs in domestic work in the service industry, uh, less so perhaps in in certain uh, in medicine or, or others, whereas Europe needs different kinds of labor. And so you'll start to see people from different backgrounds going in different directions. I imagine people also go to countries they feel they have a link to. We spoke about language. Sometimes there's a sort of, there's a strange thing, but a kind of colonial history. Um, and people also develop lines of migration from one country to another. Canada has a large population of people who come originally from India. They'll form then groups to make it, e- and that makes it easier for more people from India to go to Canada. Yeah, I mean, we see this. This has been something that's historically been the case. It's easier to go to a place where you know people, you can speak the language. There is a great deal of circulation within the former British Empire, of course, within the former French Empire. Um, Those kind of connections, yes, continue to guide people. But we do see people moving into different sorts of places. So uh, it's not just Canada, but they're going to smaller towns in Canada, for example, or different places in the United States where their, their relatives might have never gone. And of course, increasingly, we're seeing different types of, of movements and, and new groups settling in and guiding what will be future in migrations. Professor Loren Landau, thank you. Professor of Migration and Development at the Uni- University of Oxford, a research professor at Wits University. Really appreciate the time. In a moment, you mediate a conversation around migration and immigration will continue. We'll speak to the attorney, Gary Eisenberg. Ten minutes to nine. SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Still very heavy on Jobo Gen 1, uh, north and south down towards the Winnie Mandela off ramp. There's all sorts of traffic light problems along Winnie Mandela these days, coming out of four ways into Bryanston and the bridge is gridlocked. So the N1 south queues from Ravonia, uh, the N1 north queues from Bayers Nordia. N3 from Alex moving up through Limbro Park in towards the Baclou interchange stays uh, fairly heavy. And if you're going the other way on the N3, a crash at Ilan. So just passing the cement factory, uh, that all gets a touch on the slow side. A fatal crash on the R20. North just by Tembisa uh, by the NGEN services. So if you're on your way to Pretoria, there is a slowdown as you approach that particular scene. In the N1 South coming out of Pretoria down towards the R21, uh, that crash scene uh, starting to uh, ease traffic flow past it now, which is good news. Uh, breakdown on Durban Zen 2 between Sabaya and Gateway. It's been there a long time. It's in the road works as well. So traffic coming through uh, from that Sabaya exit is all backed up. Uh, Cape Town's been a busy morning. Uh, the N1 inbound stays very heavy from Platycliffe Hill territory all the way through to the elevated freeway. Uh, behind that routes like the N1, Marine Drive, Kuburg Road, they're all backed up trying to get into that N1 uh, traffic moving slowly towards town. And just keep in mind there's a massive cruise ship that's uh, just docked in the last half an hour or 40 minutes at the harbour. So that's going to cause a lot of onlooking traffic on that N1 elevated freeway section. And then it's going to put a lot of congestion as, uh, as the passengers disembark and enjoy Central Cape Town, the CBD and the waterfront area. Whenever these big cruise ships come into the harbour, it has a massive impact on traffic. If you've got to get into Cape Town today. It's going to take you forever on the N1, and it's going to stay busy around the central area for some time. Also, the N2 inbound stays heavy from Lunga up through the hospital bend. There's a broken down truck on your way in at Mowbray Main Road responsible for that. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Mediated conversation on SAFM. Eight minutes to nine, continuing your mediated conversation around migration and emigration from South Africa. Gary Eisenberg is an attorney and director at Eisenberg and Associates. Gary, good morning. Hi, good morning, Stephen. If you leave South Africa, is it difficult to keep your South African citizenship? Uh, The word (laughs) is not difficult or or not difficult. Uh, It is, um, we have law, we have very strict legislation. So um, we have a particular provision in the South African Citizenship Act, Section 61A, become quite a notorious provision that if a South African, without the permission of the South African government, obtain citizenship of a foreign country by some voluntary and formal act, they automatically lose South African citizenship. And that, of course, is now the subject of confirmation hearings by the Constitutional Court, and we're expecting uh, their decision uh, probably in the next year on on whether or not that automatic loss is constitutional or not constitutional. Um, are you, are you, I mean, some, are you able to actually say to the department, I'm getting a passport of another country, can I please keep my South African passport? Yeah, well, that's the expectation of our legislation, and that's the expectation, therefore, of the South African state, that if you intend, as a South African citizen, and not being a minor, 
uh, obtaining the citizenship of a foreign country, uh, the expectation is that you're going to apply for permission to do that, to retain your South African citizenship. If you don't, there's an automatic loss. If you do and you get the permission, you won't lose your South African citizenship with the effect that you'll hold both. Is it possible to predict what the outcome of that case will be? There's 900,000 people around the world who this could affect. Well, it could affect many more. I don't believe that those figures are particularly reliable. I've listened to your previous listeners, uh, uh, speakers, and I must say that uh, this information is probably very unreliable because there is no way, even looking at the statistics of uh, what has been reported by foreign governments, do you know whether South Africans are living in a foreign country temporarily or whether they've obtained the citizenship of those countries? A lot of those statistics are not published. So I don't believe, though, I think those figures are underreported. I think there are many more South Africans who have left between, 20, uh, between 2000 and 2023 uh, and probably double that amount, uh, double that number, maybe two or three million South Africans who have left over the last two decades. But nonetheless, there are many more South Africans even who have returned or are living in South Africa who have never left and who have got the citizenship of foreign countries. Uh, by descent, uh, for example, a lot of South Africans have got British citizenship and Australian citizenship um, and who've never left South Africa. And and um, they, they really are relying on the constitutional court uh, deciding that that provision is unconstitutional following what the Pretoria High, what the Supreme Court of Appeal has recently decided. And therefore, if they had lost South African citizenship and the constitutional court agrees with the SEA, they will, their citizenship will all be automatically restored. And then it becomes a really a bureaucratic problem of how the Department of Home Affairs is going to handle those restoration applications. We've seen many debates around the issue of citizenship around the world. And I mean, in many places, it used to be if you were born in Russia or Germany, for example, you were only allowed to be the citizen of that country. And different countries did this in different ways. Uh, Germany, for a long time, I think it's changed now. If your parents were German, it didn't matter where in the world you were. If your ancestry was German, you were German. In South Africa, uh, it also depends on where you are born. If you're born in South Africa, uh, you are often South African, not always. I know there are exceptions to that. Um, are we seeing internationally the laws around citizenship changing in any particular direction? No, I can't see a pattern. Uh, there are certain countries like Holland, for example, that seems to be getting stricter uh, in preventing dual citizenship. But by and large, uh, countries, generally speaking, our major trading partners allow dual citizenship. And South Africa currently, you can hold 20 citizenships all at once. It doesn't make any difference how many, depends how you get it. So um, I, I, I can't see a trend in that regard at all. It's interesting because, I mean, we've seen, I remember famously, there's a football World Cup where two half-brothers were playing against each other. They were playing for different countries, one for a European country, one for an African country. And yet you would think around the world there'll be a bigger conversation around what citizenship is and around borders, especially when you have organizations like the European Union, for example, where once you're inside, you don't really notice you're going through a border. And yet that doesn't seem to be happening. Issues around citizenship seem to be kind of almost where they were 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I don't think the, the emphasis is really on citizenship, it's on migration. And I think if you make the point that countries are becoming more nationalistic, uh, more exclusionary, I think that's true. Uh, countries are trying to limit as best as they can uh, in migration. And I think they're doing that as a result of the refugee crisis. Many countries have taken in too many refugees, which uh, this would be a conclusion they arrive at in retrospect. And then there's a backlash against that uh, because there would be an inclination, a pollution of local culture, uh, of local moors, and uh, that's taking place in Scandinavian countries, in the European Union, uh, and therefore there's a, a countervailing 
force of trying to limit ordinary migration. Uh, and that I can see as an increasing pattern in South Africa as well. Gary Eisenberg, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate it. Attorney and Director at Eisenberg and Associates. My thanks also to Professor Lorraine Landau, Professor of Migration and Development at the University of Oxford and a Research Professor at Wits University. And starting us off today, Diego Itarulde is uh, the Chief Director for Demographic and Population Statistics at Statistics South Africa. Bringing an end to your mediated conversation this morning. Top Sport with Michael Abramson. Star Rugby correspondent, Hotso Sello, at key match at the top of the table. The Bulls obviously very, very much second best against Leinster. They just didn't put it together at all. But we always knew this was going to be a tough game and indeed you predicted as such when we spoke about it last week. Uh, 100% Michael, I think Leinster has been a, a team that's been a little bit unlucky in the past two seasons. They've been uh, trophyless and I think that's one of the main reasons why they brought in Jacques Nina but, uh, from the Springboks as, as, as they they head coach. I mean, Jacques Mina, but has won two World Cups at the Springboks. And I think they needed a, a winning formula. It, it, it hasn't been a case of Leinster not being able to put together a team that, that can trouble a lot of sides in terms of scoring points. Top Sport on SAFM. SAFM. Well, thank you very much indeed for being with us on SAFM Sunrise this morning. We, of course, will be back tomorrow from Paul, from Melissa, from Mdu, from Sons of Myself. Look after yourself. Kathy is next to you with SAFM leading the conversation. It's nine o'clock. Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, communities stranded after their eviction from private land and KZN police confirm gunning down nine suspects. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luanda Maume. Residents of Lehigh Phase 2 near Orange Farm in the south of Johannesburg say their children are unlikely to return to school as the second term of schooling gets underway countrywide this morning. This after the Red Ends demolished multiple structures last week, leaving scores of residents, mostly women and children, homeless. The authorities say the structures were built on private land. Most residents lost their belongings during the demolition of the structures. This residence is temporarily living with neighbors. house was demolished on Thursday. I don't have a place to stay. I am stranded with my kids. I don't know where to go. Right now I'm staying in next door. I asked that girl to please keep me for a while with my kids. So so can you please assist me? I am stranded. I don't know where to go. The city of Eguruleni says it is working tirelessly to restore power in several areas in Boxback in Eguruleni. This after residents embarked on a protest after enduring 10 days without electricity. DA Eguruleni Councillor Simon Lapping. Yesterday, they were working on a, laying a 1.2 kilometer cable. They did work right through the night, and it's hoped that they, this uh, laying of this cable will be completed by this morning sometime or later in the day this morning. And then with all the connections and testings and all that has yet done, that we should see electricity tonight. Kwazulu Natal police have confirmed gunning down nine suspects who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. They were killed in a gun battle with police in Marion Hill, Deben, in the early hours of this morning. Police are looking for two more suspects. Provincial police spokesperson is Robert, ne- Robert Nechiwunda. The suspects were also sought in connection with a case of rape where they allegedly gang raped a girl and made a mother to watch the old deal during a house robbery. They were also on police radar for serious and violent crimes in the area. When police caught up with them, intelligence had uncovered that the suspects were plotting to execute a hit on someone. Three firearms have so far been found in possession of the suspects and such is still ongoing. A main hunt for the two assassin suspects is underway. Legal analyst Benedict Piri says the Speaker of the National Assembly, Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula, should stop what attempts delaying tactics and hand herself to the police. Last week, Mapisa Ngakula launched an application in the High Court in Pretoria to effectively prevent police from arresting her. Yesterday, the court dismissed the application with costs. Mapisa Ngakula is accused of corruption during her tenure as Defence Minister. Piri says handing herself to the police would be the sensible thing for Mapisa Ngakula to do now that she has lost a court case. We know how difficult it is to appeal when you've been struck off the roll for a lack of urgency. I I don't think that is a viable 
alternative for her um, and the only sensible thing for her to do and probably the only thing for her to do right now would be to make arrangements to actually get processed in a manner that would allow her the same courtesy that she would have been allowed where she wouldn't be detained for very long and she'd be in court simply for the bail application that the, the state would not oppose and thereafter the, the matter would be postponed and it would move on from there. The following story contains graphic details which may upset sensitive listeners, including children. A pastor and his son will be back in the Whitbank Magistrates Court in Bumalanga on the 9th of this month. Pastor Solomon Mtlanga and his son Enoch appeared in court yesterday on charges of attempted murder and kidnapping after they allegedly abducted a man and cut off his hands. Dumisani Mtlangu had been accused of stealing at the pastor's church a week ago. Provincial Police Spokesperson Donald Mtlangu Yes, the two suspects appeared in court. One is age 55 and the other one 20. Uh, the two males' uh, case was postponed to 9 um, April uh, for bail application. And this follows an incident whereby a 30 year old man was um, chopped off his hands, and a case of attempted murder has been opened. And yeah, we hope that uh, as they appear in court, the the law will take its course. And finally, Pope Francis has made confidential revelations about the political maneuvers used to sway votes during the last two Vatican conclaves to elect a pope. In a book entitled The Successor, My Memories of Benedict XVI, to be published in Spain today, he reflects on his relationship with his predecessor. Pope Francis says cardinals used him to attempt to block Joseph Ratzinger as Pope Benedict, was known then because they didn't want a foreigner in the role. Recapping your top story, residents of Lehigh Phase 2 near Orange Farm in the south of Johannesburg say their children are unlikely to return to school as the second term of schooling gets underway countrywide today. This after the Red Ants demolished multiple structures last week, leaving scores of residents homeless. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 9.30. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. SAFM has signed a code of conduct that is enforced by the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Under the code, we are committed to giving news that is accurate, comment that is fair, and programming that is not harmful, does not amount to hate speech, or contain violence or explicit sex. If you think we are not living up to that code, then you can inform the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Direct any complaints in writing to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. PO Box 142365. Craig Hall 2024 Fax to 011 326 or an email to bccsa at nabsa.co.za For more information, please visit www.bccsa.co.za Talking Point with Kathy Mosasana. Weekdays, 9 a.m. till midday. The Nationalists had various ways of counteracting any kind of resistance. And if they saw that a person, of course, they had the very big, wide network of... Uh, special branch police mm-hmm. That's right. and they spied on you they attended our meetings the ANC all the political meetings right. were invaded by the special branch mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who listened to the speeches and made notes mm-hmm. and, reported. and then that was taken to the headquarters mm-hmm. where the decision was taken who should be punished. And the first punishment was to ban you. That meant that you could not be in any social gathering and you couldn't be in any educational institution or for that matter, you couldn't be near any factory. So you couldn't influence pupils, or influence workers in any way. 
because these were the two forces that the Nets knew would bring them down, and indeed they did, as history proved. This government became very clever. They saw the Achilles wheel, heel, and so they set up a government of what they called unity, but there's no unity really. Professor Fatima Mir there is speaking about just the time of the dispensation of our democracy. She, of course, a political leader, publisher, human rights and gender activist. And it's part of um, our reflections of Freedom Month. That's what the month of April is. Uh, so much for us to look back on as a country and to remind ourselves really of what it is we have had to overcome in order to be where we are today. It's nine after nine o'clock. Welcome to The Talking Point. I'm Kathy Mulhashana and I'm with you until midday. Coming up on the show today, we'll kick it off with the National Roundtable. It's our open line and um, we're probably now counting down to just about um, under two months before we get to the elections. And we have many political parties that have had um, the opportunity of launching their party manifestos. We now also have an indication of the independent candidates um, that are set to be contesting this election. Uh, The window, of course, for objections has been opened uh, following the opening of that candidate list by the IEC. And let's just remind ourselves, right, we have 14,662 candidates Um, that are contesting for seats in the National Assembly and also in the provincial legislatures. Those seats uh, come up up to 887 seats. So um, as you can tell, there are going to be many, many, many uh, disappointed people after the 29th of May. So it is going to be a fierce contest nonetheless. But I wonder, where are you? in the process of deciding who to vote for. How are you approaching this particular matter? Are you keeping up with what the political parties are saying in their manifestos? Are you bothering to look up the different parties that are on the list of the IEC? Are you bothering to check who are the independent candidates, not only nationally, but also those that will be uh, contesting elections provincially or even regionally? How bothered are you to actually go and find out more? Zalma, you're not bothered. My technical director, Zalma, says she's not bothered. You're not, you're, you're not there. How da? Like, it's just, I I want to know from you, where where are you in this process of deciding who to vote for? If you are intentionally seeking out more information, what kind of information are you looking for that's going to help you decide what to do? And if you're not, why are you choosing not to? Because by now, you know, a bit of election fever should be gripping us, you know, campaigns all around, door to doors, um, what rallies and all the likes, right? Political parties are busy. Candidates are busy. But is it getting your attention? is what I want to know. I'll take your calls on 086-000-2032. That's a number to dial on the WhatsApp voice note line. You can send your voice notes and text messages on 0614-104107. Is there anything in particular, or any parties, any candidates that are catching your eye that you think, well, actually... Um, um, I think I'm almost ready to make the decision, right? I, I love um, how, how, how Tony Leon put it in an opinion piece um, that he spent this morning. He says that uh, it's a small decision that has big implications. And it's so true 
small decision, big implications. But where are you in the process of deciding um, which party or which candidate um, you're going to be voting for? We'll keep it uh, with the election theme then for our Citizens Corner today. Uh, we're going to be talking about safeguarding the integrity of the elections. We'll be joined by the chairperson of the IEC, Musotu Mweba, and we'll be talking just about some of the issues around safeguarding the integrity of the election already um, there have been a number of concerns raised and you know I think the IEC can never really do enough work when it comes to the question of credibility and making sure that South Africans really are confident in their processes and trust their processes so that's the conversation we'll have in the second hour of the show and for the final hour we're going to be then uh, just taking a closer look at the implications of the Speaker of um, Parliament, that is Nosivio Mapisa Ngakula, uh, losing her bid to interdict her arrest yesterday. What does it all mean for her now um, in relation to her position as the Speaker? Uh, especially now that we know that she's uh, due to hand herself over to the police. Um, should I say any any time now? It's really just a, a, a countdown against the clock. Could happen today, could happen tomorrow. But I'm sure by the end of the week, uh, she would have handed herself over uh, to the authorities. But what does that mean once she has been officially processed, uh, particularly for the position that she holds as the Speaker of Parliament? So we'll take a look uh, at that particular conversation in the final hour of the show. Looking forward uh, to being in conversation with you and hoping that that, of course, you will stay with us for uh, the three hours of our conversation. We'll kick it off with the National Roundtable. 086-000-2032 is the number to dial. On the WhatsApp voice note line, 0614-104-107. Let me kick it off with these WhatsApp voice notes that have come through before we go to a break. I'm back with your calls. Morning, Kathy, your team and the listeners. I'm ready. I'm ready. I know exactly who am I going to vote for. Can't wait for the 29. In fact, I want to try to be the first in the queue on the 29th of May because 29th of May is my um, 1994. Uh, also, Kathy, I did raise an uh, objection for the person called uh, Cyril Madamela Ramaphosa uh, to be removed from the candidate list, but IEC hasn't responded to me. Why do, what do I do to follow up? Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning, Sis Kathy. This is Bonai Joanas here in Bluefontein. Sis Kathy, I would just like to comment about the issue of Miss uh, Ngakula. I think uh, the speaker should just go and hand, in, hand herself uh, in the police station. That's all because we can't tolerate uh, the more, more corruption. Please, she can just do the right thing and go and hand herself in. That is all. Thank you, Mrs. Kathy. Call us on 086-000-2032. Forgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching, and end the day with sundowners Nishi Sanyama. KwaZulu Natal is a job waiting to happen. Zakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining, and mountain biking adventures, waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagala. Brought to you by Tourism KwaZulu Natal. Aston Villa have found comfort on the top half and they want maximum points to retain their decent position. Put it back, and this time, Daniolo is around. The equaliser belongs to Aston Villa. Yet the bees want to cause havoc and deprive the villains by registering an away victory. We saw tried one of them in the first half. He's finished it in the second and Brentford have turned this round. This is the Premier League. Catch the 
exciting clash between Aston Villa FC and Brentford FC on Saturday, 6 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. The Talking Point with Kathy Motlasana. Weekdays, 9 a.m. till midday. You're listening to The Talking Point. It's 18 after 9 o'clock. Welcome to the show. Of course, it is the open line. I'm going to kick it off with uh, Olifile in Wudibe. Olifile, good morning. Morning, Kathy. Yes. Yes, uh, on the issue of this uh, political party, says you have posed the question, Okuti, uh, are we ready to vote uh, for, for this political party? Uh, not uh, are you ready to vote, but ha- have you decided? Where are you in the process of deciding have, who to vote for? I have not yet decided because as I look into the manifestos, there is no political party that says, oh, if you are going to vote for me in terms of uh, the issue of uh, the, political, the political party might say uh, our MPs or our uh, people in parliament will no longer go to the private hospital or speak the country for uh, the, the, to get the, 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 health, the, 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 the issue of uh, uh, health in other countries. And so in that regard, hey, the manifestos are mum to me because they are not raising the real issues. We are just dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. So, so I'm waiting for the party mm-hmm. anchoring in Nigeria political party CBE. Uh, our MP, Hadi Hoyako, private hospital, they go to Matikem Provincial Hospital uh, in order for them to ring back on the other delivery that most of the poor people in the country are needing. Uh, your your health uh, facility. So, so Ulifile, you're basically saying that the only party that you would be interested is in voting for is a party that explicitly says that its um, candidates, if they're elected or if they uh, get some kind of position, will not use private services. Yes. Because if you are talking about you are going to create jobs and that, we've been hearing that uh, many years. We are going to create jobs, we are going mm. to do this, we are going to do this. But the practical issue that political parties or the leaders must do is to show us that they are kid can go to Northwest University not to study at Canada. So that if we are fighting for the fees, they are kid can also ask Mama, can't you what is happening? Why can't you help this student? Because teaching and learning, you are this step here. That's all. That's the reality. Or oh, this thing of creating jobs and what what it is it, just it's 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 saying they are just playing with people there. Yeah. Okay. Olifile, I I understand you. At the end of the day, you want to know that whatever challenges you face in accessing services. The politicians will also face them, and if they face them, then they're likely to do something about it. Yes, that's my point. Mm. But I'm not saying I'm not going to vote. I will vote, but the manifestos, <laughs> they must be practical. They should not uh, sell us. Uh, yeah, uh, but Olifile, uh, right now I don't see a party that has made that kind of commitment or that is even about to make that kind of commitment. No, we are still waiting. We are still waiting. The 29 is here. But let, let's see. Let's okay. see. Let's just wait and see. But they must be practical. They must not tell us about the jobs. And there are jobs, EPWPs, what jobs they are referring to. Because even the EPWPs, they mm-hmm. don't pay a, a basic a salary. It's not living wages there. Yeah. All right. All right, Olifile. Yeah. Thanks for that. And and there are quite a number of political parties that are talking about the the issues of jobs and whether it's incre- decreasing unemployment, getting a job in every home, whatever um, the, the the idea might be. be. Of course, because it's such a big issue for the country right now. Yeah. Go go. Yeah. You, all right. All right, Olifile. Sorry, I didn't realize you're still That's on the okay. line. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs> Gogo, you're in Mirafong. Good morning. <laughs> Hello, okay. I'm very proud to tell this course, I say. 
Ish, go go. You oh, can. Okay, okay, Sitwana, yes, Sitwana. Sitwana, okay. Siya mo sang wala mo rin na isang kariki buwan kay buwan ni di ke ene duwe ki mo tona sita kutwa. Diya rata ka, 70 akir. Okay, go go. You're 70 uh, years old, okay? Yeah, bo. Ay sa le ko ako lo vo kiwa. Eh, eh, it is same promises. Same promise, same promise. You go to a to go apply la sela for but you are to apply la sela So what you are catching is in catching one of them. I think next we do not move the government to go to the authority to tell the politics how to is invented. So when I can make and take to have the I don't know how say go to an authority. I will tell you say how do you how do you. <laughs> okay, go 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 bye bye go go. Enjoy your nap on your bed. Go uh, go in Mirafong says that she is done. She wants nothing to do uh, with politics anymore because it's the same old, same old, and she doesn't get a sense that there's anything new. So she literally is, you know, would rather confine herself to her bed, even though she enjoys politics, but um, she's going to sit at a... I don't think Gogo is not going to go and vote, though. She sounds like somebody who on the 29th of May is still going to get out of bed. <laughs> is still going to get out of bed and make sure that as she goes to vote. Where are you in the process of deciding who to vote for? That's what I want to know this morning. And is there anything in particular that is catching your eye, whether it's in the manifestos, whether it's in the political party candidates? Where is the appeal for you right now? KG, you're in Pretoria. Good morning. Morning, Stephanie. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And you know what? Uh, my vote is not so great. Um, but I'm from the two parties. I was so sure that I was going to give the EFL my vote nationally and provincially as well. But uh, since a couple of months ago, when the new revised Employment Equity Act came into effect, not necessarily came into effect, it's supposed to be as uh, uh, supposed to sign it into effect sometime this month. I'm sure my vote will be going for the ANC nationally and provincially for the EFF. Coming to manifestos, their manifestos are all the same. But the one thing that I was very passionate about is employment equity, which has been revised and the new one coming into effect, that's something to, to marvel, Kathy. I don't know if you've seen it, but and, something to marvel. And, 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 and tell me, KG, why is the issue of employment equity such a big one for you? And how do you feel it affects you or it has affected you in your life right now? Kathy, um, I'm going to be a bit discreet uh, on certain things as well. But the one thing about the new revised employment equity, um, it really is not taking companies into task. Uh, with regard to employing the economically inactive people of this country, which is the majority. Um, it was actually pointed out in one of the charts that it would take black males around about 200 and something years to catch up to white people. I'm putting it bluntly as it is. Now, to me, that was totally unacceptable. In the last eight years, you will think there's been an affirmative action implemented equity, but it's not even a tip of the ice there, Kathy if you look at the numbers. So for me, we need to get black people into the economy. And one way to get them is to actually enforce employment equity in this country. We are the majority in this country, mm. and so should be the majority in basically everything. KG, how, how did you get to a point where you decided that this is actually um, the issue that's going to be um, the, the deciding factor for you in in choosing a party? Because many people struggle, right, with what issue to make a priority because there's so many issues that one can pick. You can, um, Ulifile started off with the, with the issue of just services. Go to a, a public hospital instead of going to a private hospital. Public education instead of private mm-hmm. education. So how did you get to a point where you knew that actually for me, this is the issue I want to prioritize and I'm looking at what is being offered across the, the spectrum on just this one issue. 
All right. Um, hey, it's a, there's quite a lot uh, that I can mention as well, but this one specifically, employment equity, has been a burning issue uh, since uh, what, the last 25 years that I worked in the corporate sector. So it has not sat with me well for quite some time. Now, the revised one, that, we, uh, that when I had a look at it, um, that was the turning point for me. I can mention a lot that I'm not happy with the ANC about, plenty. But this one I'm quite passionate about, and it is enforced uh, as, a, as a policy uh, direct. I'm telling you, uh, black people will start to see a bit of liberation in this country. All right, KG in Pretoria. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, I really like how, how clear you are around where you want to see change and the kind of change um, that you would want to see. And I would imagine that that also is informed and probably guided by your own experience um, being in the corporate world over 25 years, as you've said, and what it is that you still f- perceive and face as challenges. Uh, it reminds me of the some of the first callers that we had on the open line yesterday that were talking just about the issue of the fact that there's been such little transformation economically, whether for individuals, whether for businesses, and that really now is a time for that to begin to change. And I guess there needs to be a level of accountability. And KG is going to vote on that issue of accountability, really. All right, it's edging towards 9.30. We're going to take the latest news headline. I'm taking your calls on 86 triple zero two zero three two it is the na- national round table your open line on the whatsapp voice note line zero six one four one zero four one zero seven. Good morning, Kathy. In your headlines, residents of Desai in Marion Hill in Durban say the suspects who were killed in a shootout with police this morning have been terrorizing them for years. Residents Caroline Kisaki and Alfina Kumbi say the crime levels have been so high that some people have abandoned their homes. A woman has killed her six-year-old daughter and later hanged herself in Mutlaletsi village outside Bekasford in Limpopo. Police spokesperson Manisa Ledwaba says the circumstances surrounding the incident have not yet been established. And residents of Lehigh Phase 2 near Orange Farm in the south of Johannesburg say their children are unlikely to return to school as the second term of schooling gets underway countrywide this morning. This after Red Ants demolished multiple structures last week, leaving scores of residents homeless. I'll have details on these and other stories at 10. Hashtag SFM Talking Point. Hi, uh, hi, uh, yeah, I'm speaking to William here yeah, from East London. Uh, Kathy, uh, I don't vote myself. The last time I voted is when I voted for what you call for Tabon Baby. And then, and then the last local government election, I think I voted for Father Mkacho. Long time, I, I don't vote anymore. I suffered from this government. Uh, they never even address anything of my complaints. So I said, I don't vote. Because even if you vote, your vote doesn't change anything. You are just enriching politicians. They are rich. Their kids are doing well. We're not busy giving them votes for, for them to steal. Good morning, Saskati. This is Matumi speaking. For me, for the issue of voting, it's not a problem. But when you look into the manifesto of all parties that they have already announced it on a public platform, they are not convincing and they don't know what they're going to do. They just want to take ANC out. And after they take ANC out, they will fight amongst each other according to their collusion because they don't have the same spirit of saving this country. And on the issue of these people crying about the hospital, health care, what, what, People, they must just go back to where they come from and do the right thing. Go to agriculture, eat healthy, live healthy. You will reduce the burden of the hospitals by eating healthy. But as long as people, they just eat everything, drink it as, as much as they can, they will still get sick. But people, they must just man up. Good morning, Katie. You know, they must hear. Uh, Katie, in terms of decision, I've decided to vote I have two political parties that I want uh, I, I want to vote for. The reason being, as a security guard, 
this, there are only two political parties in their manifestos that says they will insource security workers, officers, and the cleaners who are working under the government sectors. We've been working in these private um, in, in these uh, departments for so many years under these service providers who pay us less, sometimes they pay us late. So I've decided which political parties, there are two, ex excluding the ruling party. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's interesting to me because what, what I see so far is that a lot of um, you that, that have responded to the question are actually looking at the personal you know matters how is what how am i personally affected um by what it is that political parties are promising um and i wonder you know there's nothing wrong of course with you've got to put yourself at the center right and decide well what's going to work the best for me um but what's going to work the best for the country too how much of that is a consideration so even if you don't feel that um, there is a manifesto that necessarily addresses issues specific to you. What about issues specific to the country? Um, you know, which parties would be the best party for the country is also, I think, uh, one of the issues we'll have to um, think about when deciding who to vote for. Sean, you are in Mtata. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Sean. I think it's important to, to, to start with, uh, I think the country has been robbed with consumer education uh, in relation to the composition of parliament. And if, if history can, can explain, there was, if not 10, maybe nine attempts to get a Zuma out of, of the presidency years, a few years ago. And the reason for that is the majority party knew they will always win because of the numbers. The numbers comes about by exactly that voting. So at the end of the day, if the seat proportion is not balanced in the National Assembly, you will never have a real democratic situation where you can say you've got a government that would be making and taking decisions, passing legislation with the poor in mind, with the country, the economy in mind. And the ANC has been capitalizing on that. Second important quick fact for me, uh, Cathy, is that you've got parties like the UDM, ACDP, COP, et cetera, with one seat. There's little to nothing they can accomplish, except for the new baby that has come about of this coalition. It's yet to, to be seen whether there should be any or is going to be any serious effect of a national coalition versus that we currently have in municipalities. The third element uh, I'm taking into account in deciding who to vote for is the party's manifestos. All the issues they are raising, the elements, the seven points, the six points, the five points, what of that is realistic? What is really doable based on having checked the facts, research, statistics of, of, of where we are, from where we're coming. Is it really, really, really doable? And what is the policies, the standing policies of these political parties in relation to that? Because at the end of the day, there's a view, political parties are all the same, but we can't do without them. We need political parties for the composition of a parliament. So one has to vote, but you cannot go and vote blindly based on emotion or based on the liking of a color or a person. You have to understand, if I vote and this party is going to be in majority, 80%, the, like they say, the, the two-thirds majority, understand that party is going to rule forever for, 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 for that term, that, that five-year term. That party is going to rule. So you need to make sure, okay, if I'm going to vote for that party, what is their current seating stand? There's no way I can vote for Bantu Alamisa. I can vote for Kenneth and Don Don. I can vote for Mosuala. There's just no way. They, they've, they've been coming for 5, 10, and 15 years, and they still have one and two seats. So they can't affect change from mm. the one and two seats. They just can't. Mm. They're just earning salaries for themselves, and they're not doing nothing for the very own members. However, the bigger parties, which is, I think we've got a top five now, correct me if I'm wrong. I would be looking at, at obviously, I will never vote for ANC, God forbid. 
but they are one of the bigger players with MK, with EFF, with DA. Uh, so you, you, my focus is on, other than ANC, these other ones, what is their manifesto of promises and pillars? Is it doable? Does, does the research, the analysts, the economists, does they, do they agree? Like, I mean, IFP is saying we'll close all, all foreign spaza shops. Ah, ah, really, what is that now? On, on what ground? So you, you're wanting to promote something else now that should not be part of democracy. <laughs> so I so, haven't honestly decided mm-hmm. what party yet. Because mm-hmm. I'm still busy uh, uh, engaging and, and doing this homework. Uh, so from the current seating of parliaments, I've, I've already got an idea. Uh, then I'm looking at the manifesto issues, which I believe is what people really should be doing. And then what is the, the party's standing policies? What do they stand for? Mm-hmm. Because the, the one thing I'm looking for is pro-economy. Because I believe, Katie, if the economy is fixed it, and it is sustained, and I believe this is what America and, and so, China so, 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 Sean, um, just on, on the issue of um, the, 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 the so-called smaller parties, right, those that have maybe a representation of one, two seats, maybe even five, what we have seen is that a lot of the issues often that come up, whether it's corruption-related issues, service delivery issues, these parties tend to be the mouthpieces around those issues, and they're the ones that are championing them and actually making sure that they are not only on the national agenda, but they find themselves also into the corridors of the National Assembly. So I don't think that it's absolutely correct to say that the parties have been absolutely use, useless, um, you know, those that have one or two seats. Okay, get to the point. It, it's fine raising an issue, but at the end of the day, one must understand the process it has to go. And everything in that National Assembly is subject to voting processes and the voting processes is subject to numbers so i can bring up the most relevant issue the country needs at the time which is like for instance load shedding Mm. but i if i'm a one-person party in national assembly by all means yes it will be debated and what you only actually in essence is just doing you giving the ruling party and those that will be ruling, giving them homework to say, okay, let's go see how we can fix this. But they were never bought it. You just raised it. But you cannot achieve that with your current state or your number, uh, numbers of one, two, three, and four. Okay. Because, I mean, just yesterday, the, the voting of, 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 of the, the, the deputy public protector. Mm. Now the process mm. must be reached. And why? The voting process element has gone wrong in the, in the subcommittee accused uh, uh, the EFF lady, Makwebana. And hence I'm saying, if people don't understand whatever happens in the country is subject to a vote which takes place in National Assembly, in the National Council of Provinces, and that is subject to the numbers of parties that have seats All right. in that uh, 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 institution. All right, Sean. Okay, we'll leave it there. Sean Outenham Tata. Yeah, I mean, he's right in that, of course, the majority um, will always win in terms of outvoting. But I, yeah, I don't think we must underplay the significance of having um, the, the representatives that we have in the National Assembly. Um, that are from other parties. I think they do a lot of good work also in bringing some level of accountability too. Um, Yeah, so so that's my view. In fact, Sean, you reminded me of something that came up in one of our conversations last week around this idea of a strategic vote, right? Um, That, you know, are people thinking about voting strategically uh, when it comes to these elections too? Um, and, and what what does strate- voting strategically mean in the context of, of South Africa? Muzi, you're out in Etequini. Good morning. Good morning, Haskepi. Uh, how are you? I'm, I'm good, thank you, Muzi. Go for it. Yeah, Haskepi, I have made my decision. <coughs> uh, and I'm, I, I'll, I'll stick by it. I will vote uh, um, 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 as Uh Due to the fact that um, uh, our leader uh, Jacob Zuma, I started uh, started him from the time when he he won against Tabumpegi. If you remember at that time, if he was a person who was hungry for power, 
that day, the following day, he was going to be the president of the country. But what he did, if you remember, he didn't want to to go to the to the to the office through the back door. He waited. He wanted to go down to the ground and speak to the people and talk to the people. And he, he opened the space for Halima Montante to become the president while he was plowing, uh, talking to the people. Hence, if you remember, when he became a president, he became a skunk, <coughs> a skunk of the of South Africa. Why? Because the powers that be could not control him. Even today, he is smelling. Why? Because he refused to be to to be to be obeyed by the powers that be. That is why he he, he, he even ended up uh, chased out before even he, he finished his tenure. You remember this? this, this so, this, so, this. so 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 Muzi, uh, yeah. uh, you are voting um, for the MK, as you said, just yeah. based on the personality of the former president Jacob Zuma, because he's somebody and that you record. have that you have already that you've long supported. And the record, Katie. The, the record, record of what? So the record very, of what? The record, his record. Because he became, is... a pre- he became a president before, mm-hmm. and there are things that he did that you complain of. You remember, there was a load shedding that started when he was a president, and he did stop load shedding. That is a fact. No, he didn't stop that load cannot... shedding, was he? He did. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. So load shedding was there when... Uh, uh, when, when uh, um, he was a president. He didn't stop it. Because he, my understanding... He, no, from no, he, what didn't, I know, he didn't stop load shedding, Musi. What did he do? He, he didn't stop load shedding. So no, load shedding started no, in 2018. That information is available. We, we've had load shedding for a number of years now. Close on what? Katie, Ten years. Katie, we in South Africa, we live in <laughs> when, 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 when President Zuma hired Brian Mullet and, <laughs> and Mr. Koko, Lord shedding was stopped. No, it was, it was stopped. reduced. It was reduced. It wasn't stopped, no, Mosi. It, it was stopped, and he even announced that we'll never ever have load shedding ever again. Well, do, have, okay, have, have we never ever had load shedding again? We had after he was fired. No, as as What about was, the, okay. constru- the construction of Midubi and Kusile? Those were supposed to be completed under him. What happened there? Okay, it's part well, of the that, reason. That, no, it's part of the reason why we're still in this load sh- shedding problem that we have. Those were no, the I'm, two big build projects that yes. speak directly to um, yes. our to helping alleviate our electricity issues that needed to come yeah. on board under his presidency. Not only were they not completed by the time he left, the cost of those projects had more than doubled. Yeah. No, no, no. I'll get it. That, that you can argue. And I know... No, it's not about can... arguing. It's about the no, facts no. that are there. So, Muzi, so, so, Muzi about... accord, so according to you, what is the, the record? Because remember... Um, my question today is that I'm trying to understand yeah. the processes that people are going through as yes. they make the decision around who to vote for. So if, one, if I've heard you clearly for you, your process is that this is a man I've, in, I've supported um, yes. from the early days and I'm going to stick with him. Um, yes. I have a view on what his record is, despite yes. what it might actually be. But your your view, 